Oke, sudah. Silakan dimulai. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most beneficent. For the mercy and grace which allow all of us healthy amidst the pandemic and bless us with the opportunity to attend this day's event. Before we start this webinar, allow me to read the rules for the participants of this webinar. The rules for the participants are the participants are expected to wear polite and neat clothes. Participants are expected to use the virtual background of the event. Participants are expected to rename their Zoom account with the format of institution name underscore participant name. Participants are requested to turn off the microphone during the webinar. Participants are expected to turn on the webcam during the webinar. Participants are required to fill in the attendance list, which will, log, which will later be used for making e-certificates. If participants want to ask a question, they are expected to click the raise hand icon. Lastly, e-certificates will be given to participants who attend until the end of the webinar and fill out the attendance list. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to the eighth and this course last architecture lecture series with the title of Sustainable Design in Practice. My name is Agara Damaga Putra. I'm from the architecture program, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia, and it is an honor for me to once again be the MC for this webinar. Before we start the event, I would like to especially welcome our important guests, the Honorable Professor Dr. Didi Sukiyadi, the Vice Rector of Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia from the Education and Student Affairs. Okay. Also to the Honorable Dr. Iwakuntadi, the Dean of Faculty of Technology and Vocational Education. Also welcome to Dr. Dedi Rohendi, Dr. Dedi Suryadi, and Dr. Anna the Vice Deans of the Faculty of Technology and Vocational Education. Also, I would like to welcome the Honorable Ibu Tutin Arianti, PhD, the Head of Architecture Program, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. And Pai Yudhistira Kusuma, MRs, will be the moderator <laughs> and lead the discussion session in this webinar. I would also like to welcome all the both. I would also like to welcome both of our renowned speakers, Mariam Eskandari, and Prasetyo Adi IAI. Also, welcome to all of the participants. It's truly really an honor to have you all here in this webinar. To get started, let me read out the rundown for this webinar. We will start by opening from the MC. Then we'll continue to program chairs report from Ibu Tutin Arianti PhD. Continuing to vice rector speech from Professor Dr. Didi Sukiyadi. Then we will enter the presentation and discussion session, which will be led by Yudhistira Kusuma MRs. After that, we will have photo session and closing by MC. That's the quick update for the rundown of this event. Therefore, to continue the event, I would like to invite the head of architecture program of Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia, Ibu Tutin Arianti PhD, to give program chair's report. Ibu Tutin Arianti PhD, time and place are yours. Thank you, Pak Agara, for uh, the warm welcome this morning. Very good morning, Bapak Ibu, colleagues uh, and students. As the head of the architecture undergraduate program, it is my privilege to welcome you all, especially our Vice Rector for Education and Student Affairs, Professor Didi Sukiyadi, uh, the Dean of Faculty of Technology and Vocational Education, Dr. Iwakuntadi, the Vice Deans, 
Dr. Dedi Rohendi, Dr. Dedi Suryadi, and Dr. Anna. And our special speakers, Architect Mariam Eskandari and Architect Prasti Adi. Welcome again to UPI Architecture Lecture Series number eight. The UPI Architecture Lecture Series is an online public lecture that we, we initiated last year as the pandemic hit all over the world. It is an irony, right, that the pandemic has restrained us from any mobility, the one that we have never encountered or imagined before. But fortunately, it offers us with an open opportunity to learn or to share knowledge and experience with others across the, across the globe. And this year, our program wins the Program Kompetisi Kampus Merdeka or the Independent Campus Competition Program Grant, uh, which is funded the, by the Indonesia's Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology. And this has provided us with a great support to organize a series of online public lectures. And in, in collaboration with the West Java Indonesian Institute of Architects, we invite speakers from various backgrounds. They are professional architects, policy makers, community planners, and scholars from world-class universities. We invited Sofian Sibarani, who was the winner of the Indonesia's New Capital City Design Competition, Akmalia Zain, a Chief Specialist at the Rail Planning and um, Project Development Department in Dubai. We also invited Dr. Madhitya Paramita and Elisa Sutanujaya, who are community planners. We invited Vera Juntrista Fardani and Mukoda Shuhada, policy makers who work with Bamboo. We also invited Gauri Barat from SEP University India and Amanda Ahmadi from the University of Melbourne, who are architectural historians, and also Dr. Rizal Muslimin, a scholar from the University of Sydney, and architect Andi Rahman, who is a young prominent Indonesian architect. Of, um, each of the lecture was attended by around 300 participants, and uh, even our last week lecture was attended by more than 450 participants from across the globe. I wish to take this opportunity to thank, to thank Professor Didi Sukiyadi for um, sparing his precious time with us to give a remark. I also would like to thank uh, our Dean and Vice Dean. And also I would like to thank our guest speakers as well. We are fortunate this morning to have architect Mariam Eskandari and architect Prasetyo Adi with us. Mariam is one of the prominent female architects in the US who successfully runs her own architectural bureau, MIMS Design, and she's uh, 10 hours uh, behind us. So thank you so much, Mariam, for spending your evening with us. And Prasetyo Adi is uh, the core founder of Green Building Council Indonesia. He is now in his working hours in Jakarta, I believe. Thanks also, Pak Tio, for sharing your time with us. This is such an honor and an encouragement to all of us to make such an event like the architecture lecture series successful and sustained. And last but not least, I wish to thank all of my colleagues, my, um, Dr. Ilham Denia and uh, um, uh, other lecturers who serve as the lecture series organizing committee. They have worked hard hand in hand for months with me to make this event possible. I can't thank you all enough. Thank you again, everyone, and please enjoy the lecture. Thank you, Ibu Tutin, for the detailed and warm report. Before we start our main agenda, it would be our greatest honor to also invite Professor Dr. Didi Sukiyadi to give his speech. Professor Dr. Didi Sukiyadi, it is an honor for us to give you the time and place, please. Thank you, Agara. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. wa salatu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala rabbi surahli sadari wa yasirli amri wa hul uqdatam milisani yabkahu qawli amabadu. The Honorable Dean of Faculty of uh, Engineering and Vocational uh, Education, the Honorable Vice Deans, the Honorable Head of the Departments, the honorable professors, uh, seniors, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude and appreciation to especially Ibu Tutin 
who has been able to uh, manage uh, this activity, this lecture series in a very good manner. I also thank all uh, parties who have already supported uh, this program in a such a way that uh, this uh, very good program can be done in a very uh, in a very in a very good way. Uh, but uh, I really appreciate that you can organize uh, this lecture series program. Uh, in which you are able to invite uh, prominent figures in the uh, architecture area, not only from our country, but also from uh, other countries. I do hope that, and I believe that this kind of uh, lecture series program will be able to enhance the skills, the knowledge, and also perspective of our students. So they will become part of the global society, especially architecture uh, society. Uh, I also thank the uh, speakers of uh, today's uh, lecture program. Uh, first, Pa Tiok, uh, Prasit Yoadi. I know that Pa Tiok is a very well-known architect in our country. Uh, I read uh, her C his CV from uh, the internet that Pa Tio has ever worked in Lipo land. Yeah, Pa Tio, yeah. And I know uh, Mariam is a very well-known and a very important figure in architect uh, uh, area in the in the US. Uh, he, she is an advisor of uh, uh, Harvard uh, Art and Architect, yeah, something like that. Yeah, I do not know very much about uh, about uh, architect. Um, be, but I heard and I was told by Ibu Tutin that uh, uh, architect has a very close relation with culture. Yeah, uh, Ibu Tutin once told me about that. And what I could uh, see is that uh, the the type of uh, how, how uh, most uh, is uh, uh, design and built in Western culture and in Eastern culture is quite different. Yeah? Uh, it is because of cultural differences. And not only uh, most, I think, but uh, make the design uh, in uh, Western countries and in Indonesia, I think, is different. When I go to make the in uh, uh, Indonesia, the urinoir is uh, specially designed for uh, Indonesian people. Uh, but when I go to make the in Korea, in uh, UK, uh, the design is different. Uh, yeah, it's, it's different. Yeah. Uh, so, so if we if we want to be successful in business, for example, in Indonesia. Uh, we have to adjust the uh, structural uh, design according to what Indonesian people need. Uh, if uh, in Indonesia, uh, make the or hop band or mall, for example, do not uh, provide any uh, prayer room, uh, that will be a problem for Indonesian. But that kind of uh, facility uh, cannot be found in other places uh, in uh, Asian countries like in Singapore, in Korea, in Japan, or in, or in Western countries. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, I, know, I, I know, I heard from Ibu Tutin that architect is, uh, be belongs to social science, Ibu Tutin, yeah. Uh, but engineering or construction belongs to yeah hard, hard science. I, I don't know yeah. Uh, but uh, Bututin uh, does many research in terms of uh, what we call uh, the relation between uh, architects and, for example, gender uh, 
uh, yeah how 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 uh, gender influences uh, the design and the structure uh, of buildings including mosques so for example in indonesian mosques uh, we usually uh, uh, secure a place for uh, especially for uh, women uh, women uh, space prayer and also uh, The, the 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 we have a kind of curtain or something uh, like a barrier so it... I'm muted by the host yeah uh, so uh, I, I that's a kind of uh, relation between uh, architect and uh, culture and also with people that uh, Bhututin once told me about. So architect is a very interesting uh, area to study. And I believe that uh, with this kind of uh, activity, uh, our students will learn a lot. Uh, they will have, I think, uh, more questions. They will have also more answers about uh, current issues in uh, the, their area. And I know that uh, pandemic is also uh, uh, one factor that influences the way we see uh, uh, some things around us, including building, including uh, structure. So I think we have more to discuss about, uh, about uh, this area. So again, uh, thank you, Bututin. Uh, thank you, all the speakers. Thank you, Ibu Ilham. Thank you, Bu Lilis. Thank you, all Pa Dedi, and also the students. Uh, please take advantage of this opportunity to uh, improve your own uh, skills, your own knowledge, your own understanding, your own perspective. Uh, and remember also to uh, create a kind of network uh, with uh, others, uh, not only in our country, but also in the world. So it will be better if you uh, have more people to talk. And also remember that we have a credit transfer program uh, organized by the government. Uh, so one of your plans is now planning to go to uh, US, but not to see Mariam. Uh, I don't know in which university, Uh, but they will stay there for about uh, uh, five to six months. Yeah, in uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, funded by the government in, uh, through what we call EISMA program. So uh, next time, I hope that Ibu Tutin students from architect uh, department, architecture department will be able to join the program so you can go abroad uh, without using your own money. Okay, again, congratulations and uh, have an, a nice uh, lecture. Uh, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Didi, for the warm and encouraging speech. So, ladies and gentlemen. To immediately start our to be exciting presentation and discussion session with the renowned speakers, I would like to give the place and time to our moderator, Yudhistira Kusuma MRs. By Yudhis, time and place are yours. Thank you, Pagara. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Right. Um, good morning. The Honorable Prof. Didi Sukiyadi, Dr. Iwa Kuntadi, Dr. Lilis Widaningsi, um, Bututin, and all uh, our attendees today. Well, first of all, since we are still in the moment of our Independence Day, let me say Happy Independence Day to our beloved country, Indonesia, to all of us. All the best wishes for Indonesia, especially in this pandemic situation. I hope we, I hope we will go through all of this sooner. So my name is Yudhistira Kusuma. Full name 
Call my name, call me Yudis. I am honored to be your moderator for today's architecture lecture series. Right, in today's session, we will listen to two presentations from our special speakers. Then we will have a Q&A session and discussion afterward. Anyway, allow me to moderate today's architecture lecture series in both English and Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, while listening to the lecture, I invite you to write your questions in the chat window, or you can ask questions directly to the speakers in the Q&A session with a raise hand on. And please um, feel free to write your question, either in English or Bahasa Indonesia. I'll try to deliver them to the speakers. Saya mengundang Ibu Bapak untuk menyampaikan pertanyaan di chat, ya, selagi mendengarkan uh, kuliah boleh dalam bahasa Inggris ataupun bahasa Indonesia nanti ibu bapak juga bisa menanyakan pertanyaan secara langsung di sesi tanya jawab dengan uh, menekan tombol raise hand. Alright, today's ALS is entitled Sustainable Design in Practice. Talking about sustainable design from my personal point of view. Um, nowadays, architects must integrate integrate this concept into our design. I think uh, we can't see this as an option anymore, considering our environmental conditions. Um, also, maybe some of us may have a paradigm that sustainable design is an expensive design. I mean, um, with advanced technology, sophisticated materials, and so on. Um, yeah, but is that true? We are, what are uh, exactly the fundamental aspects that make our designs sustainable? Um, let's start with those questions. And for that, we are fortunate to have architect Maria Meskandari and architect Prasetyo Adi here with us. Um, let us greet them. Hello, Mariam. Hello, Patio. Good morning. Good morning. Salam. Good morning, Patio. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for reserving your time in between your business. They are, well, they are both professionals and experts in architecture with many project experiences, awards, and publications. Yeah, I'll tell you about them in seconds. So it's an excellent opportunity to learn from them, for sure. Um, let's give them a round of virtual claps for our speakers. Maybe you want to use uh, emoticons below your screen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you. It's um, it's cheering. What? Well, uh, let's get into the presentation. Our first speaker is the principal of the architectural firm Meme Designs. Yeah, it's pronounced Meme, just like the um, Arabic letter Meme. I think Indonesians are more familiar with that philosophy. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to read the philosophy of that brand name, Meme Designs. Check that in memedesigns.com. She is also the She's also the professor of practice at California Polytechnic University and design creed and thesis advisor at Harvard University. She completed her master science in architecture and urbanism studies at MIT in 2011, um, and then continued her studies on social entrepreneurship at Cambridge Judge Business School in 2015. She has won some prestigious awards, the latest including the Institute of the Institute of Museum and Library Services Award in 2020 for the project Children's Discovery Museum, San Jose. Then the project, then the project Children's Museum of Manhattan has won three awards. The the National Endowment for the Arts Grant Award in 2017 and 2015, also Doris Duke Foundation for the Arts Grant Award in 2015. 
She also received a, a Hartford Honorary Award in 2015, a Woman Entrepreneur Award in 2014, and many more awards that, and experiences that cannot be mentioned one by one. All right, today um, she will deliver her talk entitled How We Live Together, Designing Communities and Creating Culture. So without further ado, please welcome architect Maria Mescandari. The time is yours. Thank you so much and salam alaikum everyone and good morning. It's nighttime here. So um, I hope you guys are enjoying your morning with maybe a cup of tea or a cup of coffee as uh, you <laughs> expressed. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and it's really, it's an honor to see everyone and get to get to spend the evening with you all. Um, as Yudis had mentioned, and, um, and, and thank you, Yudis, for the wonderful introduction, and Tutun for also the um, invitation. It's so good to see you um, virtually <laughs> here. Um, but I would also like to... Um, you know, expand on this and you guys are this university and this college is talking about such wonderful topics. I got to review some of the previous lectures um, to see. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to and truly honorable to be here with you guys this morning. You guys for this um, theme this morning, you guys are talking about sustainable design. And something that we naturally do here at MEME is sustainable design. This is just basically integrated into our pedagogy and it's a given. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and start uh, sharing my screen so you, you guys are... Um, Um, so like as you just have mentioned this, although we're talking about sustainable design and given that that's um, integrated in our discipline here and in, in the pedagogy of our design, today I'm going to focus a little bit more on the theme of um, how do we live together um, and more so on the, on memes own um, principles, which is designing communities and creating culture. And, and, I, and we came up with this principle based on some of the work that we've been doing. And tonight I'm gonna share with you, or this morning I'm gonna share with you um, some of the projects that we have been working on. Um, some of the projects that we have been working on here at Meme Designs. And the themes I'm going to talk to you um, today will be about residences, museums, community centers, and I'm going to end the conversation with mosques, um, very much about, um, you know, how do we design mosques for the Muslim community here in the United States. But before I get into the deep um, conversation of our designs, I want to give everyone here a quick history lesson about, you know, what is it like to be Muslim in the United States and how far it goes back. So um, there is what we call an American Muslim history. And we often start a lot of our projects and um, design ideas with this notion of American Muslim history. And the American Muslim history actually relates to the fact that, you know, this is this is we have the world map and this is the Muslim population. You guys um, are obviously one of the highest Muslim population you know in the world whereas here in, a, in the United States we're probably between one to seven percent you know of the of the population. There's roughly about eight million um, Muslims residing here in the United States. And which is about the equivalent of, you know, roughly about the same as, you know, 8 million Jewish people who are residing um, in the United States. 
but and then the rest are either Christians, atheists, agnostic, you know, etc. And there's all sorts of different branches. So the quick lesson, the history lesson that I'm going to share with you guys, and I'm sure you guys have probably had this lesson, you know, somewhere in your history theory courses. But the timeline and the story of American Muslims does not start in this current 20th century. It actually starts in 1492. Um, and this is and the story starts actually in Spain. So the king and queen, this is when um, the Muslim um, expansion had happened. Um, there were conquests that were taking place and Spain had basically revived itself from, you know, the expansion of Islam, you know, going into that area. So from Morocco, you know, up to Spain and then um, Portugal. And the king and queen um, had basically, you know, stopped the expansion of, you know, Islam within Spain and reclaimed Christianity in the country. And it was at this time where majority of the people had to either convert to Christianity, or if you were Muslim and you didn't want to convert to Christianity, you were either executed or you were put on a ship and sent away um, out into sea. And either you died or, um, or you landed in another land of some sort. But in 1492, when Christopher Columbus had decided that he wanted to find the new route to, you know, the Silk Road and also to India to find spices. Um, he had convinced the king and the queen that he can take a different um, route. So instead of going east, he was now going west. And, um, and to give him that permission, you know, state government sponsored, um, you know, permission to do that. So the king and queen agreed. And so with Christopher Columbus, they sent with him a series of Muslims who, who originally were supposed to be executed um, onto a boat and in order to be slaves and to provide for um, the, you know, the voyage that was taking place. There were many other um, you know, countries so at the same time, Portugal was doing the same thing. They had sent out a whole bunch of people onto voyage. Um, Britain had done, you know, the same thing. Um, the Dutch had also done the, the same thing. And so at some point there were a lot of Muslims, um, you know, migrating over to the United States, what we know as today as the United States. Um, and here, for example, is Mustafa Zemori, also known as Estevankio. Um, he was one of the very um, famous enslaved, um, you know, uh, um, Muslims who came on a ship, and he actually managed to make his way across the United States all the way to, you know, where I'm sitting today, which is in California. Um, so the story, I'm going to jump a little bit just so that we can get to, we can move a little faster. The story goes that as more and more of, you know, the different countries, as I mentioned, Eng England, Spain, Portugal, um, the Dutch countries all started to move over here to in order to find new spices or the new country or the new land. Um, many of them also brought over with them, you know, um, slaves up and down from Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Zanzibar and all of, you know, parts of Africa. So if this is, for example, the Virginia Company, which is now in um, Virginia, they also, you know, when they were first founded, they started bringing in their slaves. The Massachusetts Bay Colony, my other home um, in Massachusetts, was built and, um, you know, designed by Muslim slaves. So what we're trying to get at here is that the new story of Muslims um, isn't just something that was happening in you know the 1950s or the 1960s where we think a lot of Muslims started migrating, but rather 6,000 slaves were brought in from Africa to Virginia and Maryland, and then an, another 6,000 slaves from Mauritania and Senegal were brought over to help you know build this country. 
And in 1731 in the United States, this has been documented, this is the first record of a mosque in the United States. Um, so it was a pre-existing structure. Um, so it was, you know, a house or a little cabin of some sort. And many of the slaves would then congregate there in order to do their prayers. They obviously were afraid of their owners because their owners were Christians. Um, and so they didn't want to get caught. So they would go into these, you know, covered area um, to do their prayers. So this is now, so you guys, you know, you, you all are celebrating your Independence Day. So happy Independence Day. Um, but in 1776 is when the United States gained independence from Great Britain. So imagine all of that story, as I was saying, was before even the United States became the United States. Um, and this is not even all of the United States. This is the very first 13 uh, states that are on the East Coast. So this is when they gained independence. But although they gained independence, you know, the white Christian man gained independence. The enslaved Muslims were still slaves. Um, so this is one of the very firmest um, other uh, slaves, Jero Mahmoud, who was a slave for 44 years. And later on in 1818, when he was set free, um, he went on to become an entrepreneur, a bank investor, and even a homeowner. They, you know, slaves were not allowed to be homeowners. And he went also on to actually create a lot of mosques that we don't even know about. Um, but it wasn't until 1892 or 1847 first where um, Muhammad Alexander Russell Webb became the first white Muslim, so he was a Christian white Muslim, a white man who then converted to Islam. And, um, and he came over to your, you know, area in the Philippines. Um, and, you know, and he was first the ambassador. And so he learned about Islam. And when he converted, he started to come back and say, you know, this is the importance of having, um, you know, honoring the Muslims who have been part of the American history. We just can't say that they don't exist. We have to give them their buildings. We have to create mosques. We have to, you know, teach people about what this religion is. In 1892, um, many of you have probably studied, this is when the Industrial Revolution was taking place. Um, and prior to that, you know, in England, the very first kit of parts of the world exhibition was formed, but it wasn't until the world's exhibition was moved, you know, to be celebrated in the United States in Chicago, where the, this was the very first time that a Muslim country got to participate, and it was Egypt. And um, in when they decided to celebrate Egypt, they decided to create a Cairo street. And the very first thing that they did was they decided to create a mosque um, to represent you know, Muslims and Islam itself. But the sad thing about it is that although this was supposed to replicate you know, a mosque in Cairo, the activities that were happening you know, in 1892 and you know, and the and the view that people had on Muslims themselves were not very open. They had already orientalized um, Muslims, basically seeing them from the white man's vision or the white man's lens. And so what they wanted was belly dancing um, and, you know, and this very oriental fantasy of, you know, what is, Egypt. What is what is it like to be Muslim, and what is, um, you know, what is the definition of you know Islam and Egypt and etc. Although this was not a good image for um, Muslims in Egypt, it very much um, was a big sensation in the United States. Hollywood started um, including you know Muslims in in their stories. 
And, and so people got to know what it's like to be Muslim or Egyptian. At that time in 1914, many of the families, so this is the United Negro Improvement Association, they were very upset with the image of Islam that was given in the United States, and rightfully so, um, because their ancestors, their great grandfathers or their great, 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 great grandfathers were the enslaved Muslims that had come to this country and they had built this country. So they decided to take back the definition of what it means to be Muslim. And they created the very first freestanding mosque. Um, and this is their standing outside of it. It there was no, you know, um, you know, this there was no, you know, minaret or a dome or anything of that. It was just a very culturally implicated, you know, building. Um, so in 1924, we're not getting much closer to today's age. This is when the US Congress, the government of the United States passed what they call the National Origins Act. And this is where they allowed for Muslims from all over the world to come to the United States. Prior to that, it was very hard for Muslims to come. And so the country became a little bit more friendly. Um, and then in 1957, this is President Eisenhower, um, you know, standing in front of the DC Islamic Center. And I'm gonna show you guys that in a little bit, um, acknowledging the importance and the contributions that Muslims have had in our world today and, um, and really acknowledging the importance of Muslims in America. The, you can see that in this, you know, this particular mosque, the Islamic Center of Washington, D.C., this, the um, patrons of them were, you know, from Iran, Turkey, and Egypt, and you can see the um, same architecture vocabulary. So the same minaret that was here was very much um, the same minaret that was, you know, in the World's Fair as well. So again, establishing, you know, an architectural vocabulary for mosques in America and trying to define them. This mosque was very costly, um, and it was it was designed by an, an Italian um, architect, uh, Mario um, Rossi, um, and he was not Muslim. So they told him all the dimensions of what the mosque needs to be. By 1964, there was roughly about 1 million Muslims in the United States. Um, and this chart is now you can start seeing the significance of and the buildings of all the mosques. So you can see that by 1964, if you can see my mouse, there was it was one of the heights of building mosques in the US. So there was roughly about 100 mosques being built across the US. And then by 1980, there was, you know, roughly about 130 mosques that were brand new mosques that were built, you know, across the US. And come, you know, in the 2000s, it drops and there's nothing built. And we'll talk about that shortly. So who were building these mosques? Well, these mosques were being sponsored by oil rich countries. Um, and so with them, they also dictated the architectural style. Um, so this is a, a mosque that's in New York City. Um, and so you can imagine, close your eyes and imagine New York City, the city you know, of Manhattan, and then there's this mosque like right in the middle of it. This mosque was designed by Skid Skidmore Owing and Merrill. Um, and, and the biggest patron of this mosque was Kuwait. But this originally this mosque did not have a minaret. It was just the dome and the main structure and Rockefeller, who is a very big, wealthy American man, um, said that, no, if you're going to have Islamic architecture, it's, you have to have dome and minaret. Um, and so they built the minaret, the minaret, just this minaret itself in 1980s cost, you know, about a million dollars. 
there's no function. So we talk about sustainability. There's no function to this minaret. There's no call to prayers. There's no speaker. It's just a structure that's just up there. Um, this is another mosque. This is in um, downtown LA. Um, same thing. They, you know, we have this, the dome, the minaret. Um, and as you can see, you know, imagine downtown LA. This is obviously not very safe. There's all of these gates around it. Currently, this mosque is not very much in use, not just because of the pandemic, but just because of, you know, um, the aesthetics and the location of it. Um, so nothing of this mosque is sustainable or um, even works with the architectural context of downtown LA. So one summer when I decided to just have a road trip, I decided to go and visit all of these mosques across the United States. This is roughly about 2,100, now as of today, it's like 2,105 mosques in America. I was only able to visit 300 of them um, in one summer. It was an adventure. We can talk about that in another time. Um, but these are all the mosques that are in the United States. So the darker colors and the congestions of them obviously indicate more than 10 mosques. So you can see in New York area, there's a lot of mosques. You can also see in the Washington DC, um, Maryland area, there's a lot of mosques. So the bigger, you know, um, main area. So like, you know, there's uh, Minnesota. Um, I'm out here in California and Los Angeles is a cluster of all of these mosques. Um, we have one mosque in Honolulu, Hawaii, out in the islands. Um, and we have one mosque, you know, in Anchorage, Alaska, out in the cold. Um, so you can imagine if we took this mosque because of domes and minaret and put it in Alaska, which is very, very cold, how it will do. I don't know, sustainably, maybe someone can do the calculation for me. Um, I don't think it will do very well. But the problem was, was that Americans um, love the idea of domes and minarets. This is a casino in Las Vegas. Um, so it has all of the ar Islamic architecture vocabulary. Um, so when people see this, they think, ooh, Muslims, and then they think Aladdin, and then they think Disney. Um, and so it's sad to say that how the, the spiritual aspect of our um, architectural aesthetic has been watered down to a casino or to anything um, of this sort, but it has become, you know, a playground. This is another casino. You can see, um, you know, there's a, there's the fountain in the middle, you know, the courtyard, the mihrab, the domes, um, the minarets all around, um, restaurants, casinos. These are, this is what the architecture, Islamic architecture is in America. And of course, here's my favorite one. Um, this is the Trump Casino in New Jersey, known as the Taj Mahal. So it has all of the um, Islamic architecture vocabulary that is that we know very preciously and hold um, in a high regard. Unfortunately, the events of 9-11 um, that took place in 2001 with the World Trade Tower coming down, um, made it very hard for Muslims to build mosques in the United States. Um, because when they did build mosques, they were often targeted. Um, so they, you know, they, people would come and graffiti them, they would set them on fire. Um, and these are, this is, you know, the spray paint that was done outside of a mosque in Michigan. Um, and as, you know, as some of you guys heard we we were also for the past this past four years we were also very much suffering because our former president did not like muslims and so he had asked that um all the mosques be under surveillance um and all muslims should be under surveillance and not allowing um, any muslims to come into 
the United States. So remember, previously we were talking about how the United States had passed this law allowing for Muslims to come, and the former president was trying to um, shut that down. So we've come a long way from slaves, freedom, and trying to reclaim our identity as Muslim Americans. And, but claiming that identity and, you know, from what it started in, you know, in 1893 with, you know, almost the mockery of Islamic architecture um, and this fascination and this oriental lens, um, we now have to, is, you know, move it to another direction. And so we've been using the idea of sustainability and um, and also using the idea that, you know, the hadith by the prophet is by saying the whole earth is a mosque. And so we have to take care of it. Um, we've been using that in our um, office. We inspired a lot from Hassan Fati. He was an Egyptian architect. He built this mosque in New Mexico. And you can see that if you didn't know um, that it was, a, if I didn't tell you that it was a mosque, you would not know that it was a mosque. It's an adobe earth, rammed earth structure built. You know, there's, there's no mechanical unit on it. Everything, um, you know, works in the most natural flow. You know, the wind, the solar, um, the thickness of the rammed earth, the walls being, you know, 16 inches thick, um, allows for it to be the most sustainable mosque right now in the United States. So we've been using and we've been studying a lot about this. But then we've actually moved a little bit beyond that. And for us, what we've come to recognize is that not always do we have to build, when we're talking about sustainability, not always do we have to build new um, buildings because roughly about 30,000 tons of carbon emission gas is put out into the air when a new building um, is built. And right now, as we all know, with this you know, pandemic and what is happening around the world with climate change, um, we have to make sure it's our duty to lower um, the CO2, because if we go just that 1.5% more, um, all of us will, you know, be in crisis mode. So one thing that we've been doing in our studio is trying to figure out in a creative way, how do we teach the public about Muslims and Islamic architecture, and how do we create spaces for our prayers and for Muslims generally? So tonight I'm going to take you through those. So the very first one is we've, after the events of 9-11, a lot of Muslims did not feel comfortable going to mosques. Um, they were scared, and so they decided to turn their homes into prayer spaces. Um, our first project is um, Maryland residents. This is what we call, you know, Zen Den. Um, this was, um, you know, an area, an unfinished area of someone's house. And they came to us and they said, can you make this into a prayer space? Um, and I, we don't know how you're going to do it, but we need to accommodate, you know, about 25 to 40 people. Um, who will come and pray in this particular space. And so we were trying to figure out how to do this. Um, as you can see, it was already built. Um, so we had to work around all of the structures and the posts and the beams. And we also had to make sure because there wasn't so much light, we, we wanna work with natural light for um, a lot of reasons. How do we incorporate that? We obviously, you know, took some time and we reflected on the verse, um, you know, 36, Isra 36, Nur, which is talks about um, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. That became our concept. And so we worked around different ways of, you know, reshaping this existing building without having, without them having to build a new building. 
And so we, we, the existing floor plan was something like this. We created a prayer area, a dining area, um, a bedroom for an imam um, to be able to come and stay there, a seating area, or perhaps, you know, a woman's, um, you know, extra space for the woman's prayer area, meditation room, um, and invocation room. And we started playing around with the idea of geometry. So we created this mihrab um, and these three doors are to exemplify the unification of the Abrahamic faith. So Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. So that we are in very pluralistic, we are incorporating different methods of, um, of all the Abrahamic faith and the last one being Islam itself. We played around with the geometry, um, allowing for you know, Islamic patterns to come through. Many of you might be familiar with these Islamic patterns, but not only when we were playing with them, but simplifying them so that they become unique in their own way and trying to use it so that the, the light itself um, will be natural, you know, seem, although they're, they're not natural light, but it seems as though this space has natural lighting, um, you know, because as neuroscience has explained the importance and the psychological aspect of having natural light. And then of course, focusing on the materials, these materials were all recycled wood. Um, and they, they were, bits and pieces of doors, windows from another construction company, construction that was happening down um, the road. But we took it and we reworked it so that it wouldn't be thrown out, but rather used for these panels. And the same thing for the columns. We wrapped the columns in these Islamic patterns um, using recyclable wood as well. The, the same thing with all of the insulation, the paint, et cetera, all the insulation that, um, that, we, were, that we used were actually um, recycled um, jeans from the jean clothes that you wear. Um, so they were recycled um, and then pushed into the walls to create that extra infrastructure, that thermal infrastructure that's needed for when it snows. Um, and the next project I'm going to show you is a little bit different. Um, so we talked about, about you know, the events of 9-11 and the community feeling very scared about being Muslim, identifying as Muslim. And we were, we were asked to design a, um, a part of a museum that would help um, teach the next generation, so younger kids, what it means to be Muslim. And, you know, psychology um, states that, you know, psycho, um, psychologist states that when you teach a child from the age of six onward, when you, when you teach them about um, other cultures, they start being more open and receptive to um, different communities and different cultures. So we made sure that when we were going to be designing this particular uh, museum, we were going to be, you know, focusing on children from three months or six months all the way to, you know, 16 years old and trying to teach them through play what it's like to be Muslim. So this is the Children's Museum of Manhattan. I've shown you the graph the map um, prior, but this is, you know, we, they, we were asked to design a space. This is 3000 square feet of museum space that would represent all of the Muslim countries around the world um, in these 3000 square feet. And what we decided to do was to design a space, um, again, focusing on not just one identity of what it's like to be Muslim, but of all the um, communities, all the countries that are Muslim with their different styles of architecture and the different methods and try to put them all in a unique way in this space. And we were very cautious of, again, using recycled materials as well. So 
you know, as we created these lattice work and these and these uh, photographs, we were very cognizant of the materials that were being in place. And the way that we wanted to design this museum was that, you know, it's great that, you know, everybody in New York would be able to come visit this, but what would happen if people from other states or other parts of the country want to come if they're and they're not able to come. So we thought of one way of doing it is rather than people coming from all across the United States to visit this exhibit, we would design this exhibit in a kit of parts, easy to pack and ship it to different museums. And thinking about, you know, uh, carbon emission, thinking about the use of um, you know, oil and gas and, you know, and transportation, all of those things come into our mind when we, when we come to design all of this. So when we designed it, we designed that all of this exhibition would be designed on um, eight feet by um, 15 feet panels. So you can see the panels that are placed in there. You can see the in seams between the, um, the walls so that they fit the size of a truck bed and that they would be easily collapsible, put into a container and then shipped off to different museums. So that everybody is now exposed to this idea of, you know, um, uh, um, you know, learning about Islam and being Muslim. So, um, in this particular image, we were thinking also when we when we thought about how do we transport the museum to different locations, we then flipped the equation around and said, how do we now transport children to different parts of the world if they can't necessarily jump on a plane and visit? And so we came up with this idea of this room with the 180 degree screen with the help of National Geographic magazine and, um, and creating this you know, computer app um, on an iPad where children then get to you know, play on a map and get to pick out all the different mosques from all around the world and virtually fly um, and be in these rooms in these different mosques. So, as you can see, they have the screen in front of them here. They are, they have the app. So if they when they move and they have these sensors that are happening at the bottom of this, when the when the child moves around, the screen also moves around with it um, for them to be able to you know be encapsulated within all of the space of a mosque. We got really good um, reviews. This is from the New York Times um, about this project. Um, it became um, a, a hit. It was a sensation. A lot of um, great reviews were coming out from it. Um, many um, Hollywood celebrities um, came. This is DJ Khaled. Um, he's Muslim. He brought his child um, to this, and they did a whole um, you know, photo session for different magazines um, at the museum. And it also became, this was at a time in 2015, 2016, it also became a space for um, the presidential um, debates. So this is um, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who was running for president in 2016. She used the museum as a way to encapsulate the audience, the Muslim community, um, to you know basically say I'm I'm okay with uh, Muslims. But most importantly for us, it, the big audience was obviously the the little kids who come and play because we wanted to teach them about you know all all of the cultural heritage that we have as Muslims um, in this you know, exhibition and hoping that they walk away with knowing just a little bit more about what it's like to be Muslim. Um, we got a pretty good response. So the kids were really happy with it. Um, and from there, we then 
got commissioned for a bigger project. So now we moved from museums to community centers. So Muslims here in the United States, we, we have mosques and we have community centers. This was a really interesting project because this was done in California. This is kind of what brought me here. Um, a, um, a developer came to us and said, you know, um, we want to create a mosque. And, um, and we want to build this mosque in the middle of this area. This is the red dot. Just to give you a brief background, this area is all industrial. Um, these are all commercial areas right here. This is the whole industrial area. This is, there's car dealerships. Um, it's, not, it's not your local neighborhood mosque. Um, but these are all homes um, all along here. These are all residentials that are happening here. When he came to us and when we went to go visit the place, it was a pre-existing building. Originally, it used to be a hot dog factory. Um, this is where they made sausages and bolognese and hot dogs. Um, and the company had um, gone bankrupt. Someone else had bought the company. Um, that's why they called it Super Franks. Um, you know, Franks as in um, hot dogs and sausages. But they wanted to make it into a playhouse, like a big play, um, you know, game uh, area for children. And the business idea failed because of the location of the building. Because as I mentioned um, previously, there's all these industrial areas here, um, and then there's residentials. When we did the study, we told the developer that it's not a good idea to build, to turn this building into a mosque, because there's already, you know, five other mosques within maybe six mile radius. Um, so if people want to go to different mosques, they will go, they're not gonna come here. And so he then asked us to do this study. And what we ended up with, we encouraged him to think a little differently. And instead of creating a mosque, to create a community center and to create a community center that would be opened for everybody, not just Muslims, but for everybody. So when we came to design it, we started thinking about what would it be like to create a community center? What would be in this community center? Would it be a gym? Would it be, you know, lecture halls? Would it be, um, you know, um, a place that people can rent out for their weddings? What would it be? And we ultimately came to this idea that it would be all of those things. Um, people would be able to come there and use it like, you know, in any form or shape. And so then we decided to strip the whole uh, interior of the building itself and take everything out from what it is, but leave it in, in the most simple and plain terms so that people can see all the skin and bone and the structure of the building inside. So we wouldn't have to cover it up um, in any form. And so we ended up creating um, a very um, unique community center that, you know, when you walk in, you realize that, oh, Muslims are welcome here, um, but it's for everybody as well. Um, and the one thing that we wanted to make sure was to really celebrate um, Muslim women athletes that are part of the American Muslim identity. But more so, we also wanted to make sure that we um, incorporate the bigger uh, Northern California community by really putting some of the other athletes on there. So you can see that all of these athletes are all different Muslim um, athletes um, who have either um, been part of the Olympics or have been um, successful in their own way. This is um, Bill Reis. She is an African-American Muslim. She wears the hijab and plays basketball 
um, she, when we finished the building, she held a camp for the children um, uh, in this facility. But we also wanted to make sure that in our own unique way, we talk about um, spirituality and the reflection of you know, Islam itself. And so we decided to put quotes and even verses translated into English on the wall. Um, and so some of them you, you guys can read for yourselves are very, um, they have a deep connection with the spiritual aspect of an athlete and being an athlete. So this endurance, this fighting with the soul um, and trying to be your best, um, those were all into play. When we put up many of the Muslim athletes, we invited them to come and see themselves. So this is one of the very first hijabi marathon runners. Um, they were very excited to see themselves in you know, a big 10 foot wall. And, um, and we also have used other um, great athletes themselves, not necessarily just Muslims, but others that are um, very spiritually inclined. So we decided to um, put up Stephen Curry, who is the point guard for the Golden State Warriors. And he occasionally comes, he plays in the National Basketball Association in the United States. And so he occasionally comes and practices um, basketball in this building um, as well. So instead of building a whole new mosque um, to accommodate the Muslim community, I think we were we managed to very much um, save this building and what used to be a former uh, factory and really bringing it down to, for the community, to, for not just the Muslim community, but for everyone to be able to um, come in and out of the building. Um, the last couple of projects I want to show you are mosques, obviously, because this is what everyone is very familiar with. Um, and these are some of our new projects um, that are that we're currently working on here in the in our studio. The first one I'm going to show you is the Lighthouse Mosque. This is also in Oakland, California. It's Northern California. This is the building um, that they came to us with. It's a historical building. So I gave you all a brief history lesson on how African Americans. Um, have played an integral part in the American Muslim identity here. And more so a lot of bookstores in the 1950s and 60s were important because this is where civil rights, so the equality of all men and women, despite their religion or the color of their skin was happening. And at this time, a lot of um, bookstores, African-American bookstores, were the central location of, you know, gatherings that would take place. And so this is one of the gathering places from the 1950s and 60s. And this is where culture and community comes into play in our, in our design. Um, so this is Marcus Bookstore. You can see that this is a very famous picture of Malcolm X that you might all be familiar with. He plays a, a very important figure in American Muslim identity um, here in the United States. And we were asked to take this building with all of the historical implications and make it into a mosque because the owner of this bookstore wanted to sell this building and move. We spent a lot of time getting to know the community um, as we were designing the project. And we actually had a very hard time um, coming to a conclusion with this uh, building because it held a lot of significant historical reflection of the importance of American Muslims. So we went ahead and Per the client's request, we did an analysis. This is the building itself. You can see that um, there's a highway here. And if the building wasn't going to get renovated, this 
state of California plan on buying all of this row right here and expanding the highway because this was one block it was easier to expand um, to the west than it was to take away um you know let me draw so it's it's easy to expand this way um and buy out all of this area instead of buying you know this whole block and trying to move the highway this way so this is the location of the building and when we did the study we were very concerned that if we didn't have a good argument for the you know redesigning of this building that this all of this might go and all of this might get turned away Mm, how do I erase all of this? Okay. So when we did the analysis, we were very concerned because with the expansion of the highway, it would also take away and take out all of these trees. This is the only sort of shade and vegetation vegetation that this neighborhood has, you can see that there's hardly any trees or anything in this area. And the smog condition, the pollution in this area was very high. So taking away all of this would very much ruin the, um, the air quality of this neighborhood. We looked at the interior of the building and there's a lot of, like I mentioned, a lot of history, but it was also very beautiful. It was um, these exposed trusses were there, these um, beam and studs were, you know, for the for the tectonics of the building. And we wanted to keep that as much as we could. The the client, which was the lighthouse mosque, they they asked us to figure out a way to um, really try to keep the aesthetics of the building, but also incorporate their vision. So a lighthouse is, you know, a newer. Um, and so we agreed and we came up with this idea that the lighthouse itself would this be this beacon of light that would come out. We would create a, you know, a living wall of green infrastructure that would be there and try to keep the aesthetic of the original buildings as close as possible um, with the interior trusses um, and the exposed beam and just see if we can make it as simple and clean as much as we can. However, although you know we are architects and we're supposed to sell our products, this is our job, right? We, um, we get paid to design all of these buildings. Ethically speaking, we could not justify taking this building and making it into a mosque when there was so much culture and community and history behind this building itself. So we asked the client to actually step away from this building and um, and not turn this building into a mosque and rather look for another space um, in lieu of you know, taking this building. And the owner was very happy and sad at the same time because they wanted to sell as soon as possible because of the highway expansion. And so we found it, we found our position and our responsibility to tell them, no, you need to save your bookstore. You need to just make it better. Um, and we understand that the state might come in and make it into a highway, but we will petition for you, for your whole neighborhood to not do that. And this is where we found ourselves moving beyond our role as architects and just designing and you know, creating spaces, but also working with policymakers and governmental institutions to do our job correctly into creating spaces for our communities. Another mosque I'm going to show you, we have two more quick presentations, um, is this is a mosque that we've been working on in, in England. And um, 
and this is, you know, right outside, this is, um, you know, London itself, but this is right outside of London. And you can see that these are all of the locations of all the various mosques that are there. And to put a mosque out here, we thought was really interesting um, for, you know, a new community that's growing. We took our lessons from the Oakland Mosque, the Lighthouse Mosque, and thought of how can we implement them into a new building um, and using all of our sustainability um, ideas that we had. So there's this parcel of land that's out here um, and it's very lush and green. We did this project with our partners, Left Architects, and trying to figure out, you know, how do we create a sustainable um, design? Um, and this was just purely conceptual. Um, we did, we went through different iterations of, you know, designing a new building. So how do you, you know, some of their programming, as you guys know, when you come to do, do your design programming, there's some codes. So you have to have 140 parking spaces. You can't go underneath the ground. Um, you can't build a garage. So there were all of these, um, you know, architectural programs that were coming into play um, in designing the space. And also the, you know, the community wanted to make sure that it represented, you know, their identity. So make sure it has a dome, make sure it has a minaret. Um, while the rest of the community, which was the, you know, the greater Preston uh, community was very cautious of don't make, don't make it look like it's, you know, an alien coming in and landing, you know, don't make the dome like, um, you know, now looking like um, a casino. So they had their concerns. When we came up with the design of this, we decided to use the building as um, a verse from the Quran. So creating, um, you know, working with the landscape as the most sustainable way possible, working with the topography of creating, you know, um, working with like, you know, creating, um, you know, parking areas that would retain water um, and then be able to let it flow out into the vegetation itself, trying to keep all the trees within the area. Um, and also creating a whole new identity. So the idea for this concept was, to have this image of, you know, creating this triangle pointing um, arrow that would indicate that this is Mecca, we're pointing towards Mecca itself. When we were working on the design concept, we thought a lot about um, the, um, the mountain of Tour of Sinan and this in Surah, um, Batini was Zaytun, which is, it says, by the fig and the olive and the mountain tour of Sinan and the city of security. So we really reflected on all the things that the Quran teaches us um, in figuring out design ideas. Um, so can we create a mosque that would be filled with just figs and olives? Can it just be an earth itself? How do we use um, wudu water and recycle it so that it goes in back into the landscape. We came up with this uh, design proposal. You can see the idea of the mountain, um, you know, the building itself pointing in a triangle, pointing towards Mecca. Most of the building is exterior. So we started planting this garden on the exterior. Um, in order to, you know, have um, retaining water, gray water and um, rainwater harvesting. This downstairs area was, um, you know, restrooms. So the water that's captured from the rainwater is filtered into all the restrooms right here. And we started creating this idea of indoor outdoor um, play so that we would really reflect the very first mosque designed by the prophet himself, which was an exterior mosque right outside of his house, of how do we be, how, do, how are we able to actually pray in a landscape that represents Jannah and the heavens. So what we came up with was a very indoor outdoor experience for a mosque, not the typical dome and minaret, but now moving beyond the architectural elements of that. 
and creating more of a paradise feeling, reflecting on the Sura Latini with Zaytun, and actually planting and figuring out ways to plant fig trees and olive trees um, within the landscape itself. Um, we were figuring out how do we incorporate skylights. So the skylights are actually the cosmos. So they represent all the stars and the planets and the, you know, the heavens and the earth. And, um, and that, that kind of filters into the light itself down into the prayer space. And then of course, the biggest um, ideas were mostly the garden itself. So how do we incorporate this indoor outdoor area, being able to open up all of this prayer spaces into the garden so that there would, there would be more expansion of, um, you know, if there's a jump up prayer, how do we expand into the garden and pray? And also include women in the area upstairs that would have full exposure to the downstairs area um, and to be part of one unit rather than separate area. Um, within section, this is what we had um, with the interior dome and the light coming through down below. Women's area would be half of the men's, but then the prayer area pulling through. But more so, the idea of using the minaret as not just an icon, just a freestanding um, structure, but more of, you know, um, a, uh, an infrastructure to collect rainwater um, and then to recycle it below and retain it because, the, you know, you have to be able to water most of this garden. Um, and we didn't want to, you know, tap into any of the wells or the, um, the, the other um, infrastructure that might be there. And lastly, this is a project that we just finished up, um, schematic design package for it just yesterday, and you guys are gonna get to see it. So bringing it back to California, this is, um, again, using, unlike the Preston uh, Mosque in England, um, the community bought a bank and, um, and has turned it into an Islamic center. So no domes and no minarets, but a bank. Um, so you can see the, the, um, the, the neoclassical architecture in the front that looks very um, you know, traditional in a sense. When we did the study, we realized the importance of this building. These are next to very important um, iconic buildings. So there's museums, there's a Jewish temple, there's concert halls, um, and they were all done by very, um, you know, well-known architects. And when we did the analysis of this, we realized, you know, we have to design something that would play an integral part of and tap into the infrastructure of downtown LA. So how do we move away from allowing people to not use their cars, but to use the underground Metro so to be sustainable? How can we create, um, you know, use gray water and solar panels? And, you know, again, learning from our experiences from our other projects from Preston Mosque and others, indoor, outdoor, um, you know, to have, you know, natural ventilation, natural lighting, all of those things to come into play. And so when we did the analysis from, you know, wind studies and light studies, we figured we, you know, we also have to um, consider emissions because Los Angeles is one of the most polluted um, cities in the world. And we realized that although this is the building itself, um, you can see that this is a very, it doesn't look like a mosque. They added on another building to accommodate, you know, the community. And there's nothing, there's no natural light, there's no windows on the side except for the front. Um, and there's, there's nothing besides you go into the building and you come out the other end and you park your car. And I'm gonna show you guys um, how devastating this building is. We did an analysis first when they came to us, they said we wanna expand and we did all the 
code analysis and the Zika analysis and the environmental analysis. And we said, you guys can build, you know, to accommodate the community 20, up to 20,000 square feet. So you can build on top of it. But we're not sure how that will impact because California Environmental Quality Assurance, which is about sustainability, has all of these rules. Um, by code, you can do that, but to meet those requirements, it might be a lot more than we anticipate. We did a study of the interiors. So you can see it's an office building. We have office lighting. This is the women's section praying. This is the men's section back here. This is the main prayer hall. There's no windows, nothing. Um, and the men overflow into this hallway lobby area. Um, and it doesn't allow for any sort of, you know, um, neuroscience connection, basically, between you and your creator, the Lord, and, you know, na natural environment. This is the back. This is the parking lot. So you, you go down this corridor past this lunchroom I'm going to show you in a second. But when this all of this area gets filled, and it does on a Friday prayer, people pray out in the parking lot. Um, and this is the situation. So you can see there's potholes, people are just praying, trying to be together with the community. This is the lunchroom area. Again, if you look, there's no windows. Um, the same um, office type of uh, lighting. And it's, it's very sad. It's I, I quickly had to come out because, you know, as architects, we create spaces and they're not very well um, designed. So when we came, we went back, we learned from our other projects that I showed you the very first one of a residence, how we created that mosque space. And we spent a lot of time really thinking about what are the importance of, you know, um, Surah Noor and how light, when God says, I am the light of the heavens and the earth, he really means that. Not you know, man-made light, but actually Noor, which is the natural light where he created this, the sun and the stars and the moon. And we figured, how can we really incorporate that within our design? And one thing that we came up with was pulling the whole building apart um, to create a circulation that would have this indoor-outdoor um, flow and really bringing in natural materials so not the fluorescent lights and you know the um the unfriendly unenvironmentally friendly um you know materials but rather using a lot of um, recycled again learning from our previous experiences recycled materials natural materials like wood um you know stone that would really exemplify the earth itself and also bringing in as much of the nature um, quality within the building. And really opening up the front facade as well to get as much lighting as possible and giving them a garden. Um, you know, we talk about Jannah and paradise a lot in the Quran and in our practices, but we have to actually create those spaces for them. So what we decided to do was pull apart the building and put it back together as much as we can, um, given the budget and um, the codes that are available um, without any sort of penalty that will be there. So this is just to remind you, um, they kept telling us, how do we create American Muslim identity when the identity was before domes and minarets, but other people were using domes and minarets for casinos and, um, you know, restaurants. Um, so I said, it's time for us to define ourselves with a different identity, which is sustainability, um, you know, creating community in a different way and realign ourselves. What is Islamic architecture? So we came up with this design. Um, this is fresh off the press. Um, we removed the neoclassical um, design front and really created a um, fenestration that would, you know, be um, movable with the sun to allow for natural lighting to come through. We took the back 
that was the parking lot and really try to take away, add and subtract. So we created a garden area um, to allow for people to walk in um, and be you know, part of the building. So created a void, cut the building into thirds and allowed for that circulation um, to take place. So you walk in um, redoing the um, interior lands, I mean, the exterior front landscape to create another paradise, planting more trees and bushes, walking in and taking that with you. And also with the materials that we plan on using, which is a lot of common materials, two by fours to create screens and um, engraving the verses of the Quran um, within the different areas. So this is the lobby area. Um, and then this would be the prayer area that I showed you. Although this one now no longer has, because of structural reason, we couldn't put in windows. What we learned from our very first project was um, to create, uh, you know, and implement as much of natural lighting as possible without it being, um, you know, um, windows itself. So using um, different kinds of lighting techniques to create that natural lighting, but also putting in solar panels so that the electricity would be from um, the sun itself. We also had to take in consideration the different spaces. So this is the main prayer space that takes place. This is the lecture hall. But what we learned from the different pictures that I showed you a lot of times, the main prayer space that was there, a lot of people would come out into the lobby and pray here. And then they would come out into that kitchen or the lunch area, they would pray there, or they would come into you know, the parking area and pray. So this was a lot of space that they would fall short of. But how do we create more space um, when there isn't space? And so what we decided to do was basically create uh, movable um, partition walls that would allow for the idea of unifying one big space. So taking the main prayer space and allowing for the overflow of the lobby and the lecture hall to become one big space for Jum'ah prayers. And so this is what it would look like, um, you know, emulating all the colonnades that we see from the different, um, you know, very famous mosques from Spain and Portugal. So coming back 100 and 360 to the very first part of our project that I shared the history from Spain and really emulating that with colonnades. Um, but also these walls allow for more privacy. So if men want to pray on one side, women want to pray on another side or front or back, this allows for the different sections um, to be able to overflow, but at the same time, keep the gender segregation um, if people require that. Then without necessarily indicating which direction the mihrab is all the time, we decided to use the ceiling, the two by fours in the ceiling um, to indicate the direction of the mihrab all the time. So this all of the ceiling uh, points towards Mecca all of the time. Um, so we know which direction uh, Mecca is. And through this, the use of recyclable uh, uh, polyester nylon made from grocery bags, the carpets are now being designed so that um, they indicate very subtly the, um, the sajada that we pray on and the direction of, um, you know, our, the place that we put our head and the direction of Mecca as well. When the, when the partitions are shut, this becomes a lecture hall, um, allowing for the different needs that they have. And lastly, bringing that indoor and outdoor space. So before they used to pray on this, you know, on the sidewalk here, and this was a lunch area, but bringing in a landscape that would allow um, for people to be able to enjoy a garden. And taking that 
uh, lunchroom area and turning it more into a cafe with a lot of exterior light so that people can gather here. And if they need to, they can also pray um, in the garden as well. And I'm, I think my time is up. I might have even gone um, longer, but um, I, I will thank all of you and, um, and pass the mic on to my colleague. All right. Um, thank you very much, Mariam. It is such a fantastic lecture. You are um, taking us to the journey of um, how Muslims are developing in the United States. You know, the struggles, the pressure from publics, the government stood against, and that was uh, very open minding for us, uh, especially for me as the Muslim. Um, using that as a background and basis for your work, uh, I really appreciate that. I saw the the, com the community is the important aspect here, especially for the Muslims, um, and how you enhance their identity. I think this is the important lessons for us in terms of uh, sustainability. And then it is really nice to have a bit lessons of Islamic architecture. Um, so we know that uh, it's not just about domes and minarets, uh, it is uh, more than that. And lastly, I think I have to mention this, the sketches are so beautiful. So see, students, uh, it is important to have a scale of sketching. Uh, I have to mention that. So uh, thank you once again, Mariam. Uh, please take your time. I understand you uh, seems a little bit tired. Uh, uh, I'm kind of feel sorry for that. So uh, take a cup of tea or two. Uh, and please come back again with us in Q and Q&A session. I'm making you. Thank you. Thank so, you. Yep. So let's move on to the next presentation. Oh, before that, um, Ibu Bapak, sekali lagi uh, kami informasikan kalau ada pertanyaan yang ingin disampaikan silakan tuliskan di chat box. Nanti saya akan coba sampaikan ke uh, pembicara boleh dengan bahasa Indonesia atau bahasa Inggris. Right. Um, now move on to our second speaker. Ini adalah uh, pembicara yang sudah tidak asing lagi bagi kita. Uh, beliau adalah arsitek Prasetyo Adi Iai atau lebih kita kenal dengan uh, sebutan Pak Tio. So hello Pak Tio. Thank you for being here again with us. Um, he's a professional architect. Patio is a professional architect and urban designer. Um, he is the founder and principal director of PDW, Pandega, Pandega Design Weharima. Setelah saya uh, cari artinya Pandega, Pandega itu kalau nggak salah uh, pemuka ya Pak. Jadi leader-leadernya uh, gitu. Kemudian W Harima itu gotong royong artinya. Jadi uh, it's a leader uh, in design and um, cooperation, more or less. And according to BCI Asia, PDW is the top 10 architectural firm in Indonesia. And with PDW, Pak Tio won several awards, including EIE awards, Singapore Institute of Planners Awards, and the winner of several competitions, including the Jakarta, the Jakarta International Stadium Design Competition, Jakarta Public School, and the revitalization of Gang Gloria Jakarta. Um, ya, yeah, ini yang luar biasa. Pak Tio is the core founder of the Green Building Council Indonesia, BBCI and an active member of the World Green Building Council, Asia Pacific Network. He's also a country leader for the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. Um, 
one of the national board of the Ar Indonesian Architects Association, IAE. Uh, and then he is be his becoming yeah, is representative for the Arcasia Committee on Green and Sustainable Architecture. He also is a professional member of the Planning Institute Australia and Ikatan Ahli Perencana, IAP. In 2012, the governor of Jakarta appointed Patio to become one of the building expert team in the field of architecture and urban design. Um, education, Patio completed his master's studies at UNSW in the field of urban development and design. He also received a scholarship from LEED in 2004 and the Australia Leadership Award in 2009. Now, um, Patio will deliver his experiences and lessons from his projects uh, at PDW. It's entitled Beyond Building. So please welcome architect Prasetyo Adi Iai. The time and screen is yours. Okay. Uh, am I, is the, <clears throat> The screen on? Yeah, we okay. are seeing the screen now. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for having me. I was asked by Bu Tutin to deliver the presentation in English uh, so we can, uh, uh, Mariam also can uh, understand what I'm saying and then we will have a fruitful discussion later. Uh, this building always interests me. Uh, this is UPI. Uh, campus in uh, in Bandung. Uh, it means that uh, in sustainable last long or lifetime are uh, we're thinking about uh, we're thinking about the uh, longer time for doing the the practice uh, the practice the building and our our work itself beyond building is actually our. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, publication books that already uh, published uh, two years ago, um, and uh, it's uh, spirit of our work that uh, also include the uh, uh, sustainability in in, in practice. Uh, we are in built environment <coughs> uh, profession. We have uh, our core competencies are in uh, architecture, planning, urban design, landscape interior and uh, as a tool we use uh, BIM and our works, whether it's one of those or a combination of those that we will see in the uh, case study and our projects later, uh, that it will, uh, 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 it will always carry the message of sustainability. And the uh, mission is creating values to design. What is values? Not only uh, uh, dollars or rupiah, but it's also, uh, how, how how it's uh, sustainable. Sustainability incorporate all those things, green buildings and creative uh, and, and spaces, especially creative spaces for ours. And uh, we we are uh, doing uh, this uh, uh, through design process that we call IDE. This is uh, innovative. Uh, uh, then uh, to innovate, then we design, and then uh, later we we enrich through uh, iteration. Of of the project, and as I mentioned, uh, that uh, beyond building, we're talking about planning and architecture. It's not only goes to infrastructure, buildings, uh, a space, public space, but also uh, we have to do some politician. Of course, not as a, 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 a politician, but as an architect, as a planner, as an urban designer. Myself is uh, my my background is. Uh, uh, architects and urban designer. But we have to look into a social and economic issue. A little bit about uh, our office is that uh, even though I'm uh, senior enough, I am uh, uh, have a already 20, more than 20 years experience, but this uh, is our teams. We have uh, always have a fresh new people. Uh, we are incorporating uh, 140 people in our office. Uh, it's uh, uh, one of the biggest, not the biggest, but like uh, uh, one of the 
uh, biggest office in Indonesia. Uh, unfortunately, managed by uh, the, the the gender balance is not there yet. I should say. Uh, hopefully, there's um, uh, women architects that you can see in the previous slides that we have uh, uh, very good women architects. Our principal uh, uh, founder is Professor Danis Moro. Me and my partner Chico came later to co-found the, the company. And then we have uh, Didon and, uh, as an interior designer and Gito as an urban designer and Danny as a, as a uh, director of operations. Uh, as, as mentioned, not only me that who, are, who is active in the uh, organization, but Danny is uh, president uh, or chair, chairperson of EIE Jakarta. Gito is very active in planning institute and Chico and myself is in uh, also in associations. Uh, so with decision maker in our projects, that's not us. Uh, there's a wisdom, it's a late, uh, late uh, Pak Ciputra. Uh, who is our who's entrusted us with uh, his 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 project? Uh, one of the major project that uh, used to use you have uh, uh, foreign architects in his uh, works, but he entrusted us with one of the his his uh, uh, project, the uh, Chiputra Tower, that uh, is now under design. Uh, Unfortunately, he's passed away before it uh, come to realization. We design for people, for millennials, for younger people, of course, because when we, we have a, a time, a short time to design, then the building itself uh, is built from one to five years, the, the process of uh, design and construction. But we also have to look into uh, our uh, environment surrounding that uh, these people are also also affected by by our works as architects. Uh, back to introduction to VDW that uh, our presence not only in Indonesia, although all these projects that are we, I'm going to show you is uh, from uh, our from Indonesia mostly, uh, but uh, we also have uh, at, currently we we have a project in Cambodia. And we have done project in other places uh, throughout the uh, uh, Asia and Middle East. Um, if you talk about sustainability or climate change, uh, actually, it's not a, 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 a new new thing. It, was, it has been worn by scientists since uh, 1958, so it's more than 50 years ago. That uh, more than more than 60 years ago that it's been recognized and if we uh, do nothing uh, we uh, shortly we will need to find another planet for us to uh, survive and the, the proof is already here that this pandemic uh, uh, this illustration is brought by mosquito but with the melting of uh, of the ice caps then uh, we will have a lot of uh, a disease uh, uh, pandemic enemy uh release uh that was been frozen that's that's uh from from the scientists that was frozen uh, for millions of millions of years and i think this is a a, a good time to to rethink reset uh what are we going to do with our uh environment our earth and uh if we look into it cities are a center of this pandemic we cannot avoid Cities is uh, being uh, becoming uh, crowder and crowder, and uh, is uh, uh, we need to look at the activity. How's the active future activity will 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 be in store for us? Because then <clears throat> um, a lot of people now uh, separating life between uh, working and um, uh, working at home is uh, in a way. It, it, it kind of open your private space to public uh, domain. Uh, as you can see now that uh, I'm uh, presenting from home. So uh, if you don't have a background, then you are entering uh, the privacy, vice versa. Um, sustainable development itself, it's a balance. So it's not only, not we're not thinking about only the environment, but it has to survive economically. So 
if you're talking uh, sustainable uh, sustainability in design uh, in design practice uh, your practice also have to 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 be not uh, profitable not to be greedy but make some money uh, your client has to make some money or save some money uh, but uh, also with uh, uh, the 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 positive uh, social effect so it is a balance of the three no, nothing is more important uh, not one is more important uh, maybe in several cases uh, that uh, if we built in a conservation areas for example in in, in protected area in the forest uh, we were asked to do uh, eco resort then environment is important but still they have to to survive to uh, either make money through donation or uh, commercially and then they have to uh, uh, adapt if, if uh, in, in our profession architecture uh, that that uh, the people is the center of our uh, project uh, borrowing for from from Jan Hell uh, Dennis uh, architects uh, and, and uh, 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 urban designer there's a uh, from his school that's that we have to put people uh, at the center of uh, planning and design uh, especially in the context of a city how city can be sustainable first and then uh, lively uh, as we see during the pandemic that uh, most of the cities are dead uh, it has to be healthy. It, it's been uh, talk. Uh, it's been discussed before, even before the pandemic, uh, with the World Green Building Council, Green Building Council. Now uh, everybody pay attention to healthy city and safe city from from the disaster. Uh, uh, this is the the numbers. Uh, just uh, uh, flip quickly. But uh, in Asia, more than uh, uh, in in. 2050, there will be more than 60% uh, people live in the city. So, uh, for example, in our uh, situation, 280 million people in Indonesia, uh, we need the uh, cities for uh, what, more than 140 million people. And this is a, a picture. This is actually uh, one of uh, our our uh, colleague uh, PhD. Uh, that he observed. Uh, she she observed the population growth. In, in in Jakarta greater area if you you can see that uh, Jakarta itself is this uh, uh, the border the, the the bold black line and then the the Jakarta itself grows uh, metropolitan area although Jakarta population is always uh, not more than 10 million but the surrounding area are uh, expanding from 2 million 3 million to to 30 million uh, and, and still growing. Um, we have impacts, the construction industry. We are architects uh, or, or going to be an architects or working uh, as uh, architecture school. You can, uh, the statistics says that uh, in, on average, your 10% are becoming architect, architects and the rest will work in either uh, related or non-related uh, profession in architecture, but you always come across uh, in your uh, in your practice, uh, the, the building and construction industry, how much water we consume, uh, we create, uh, we produce emission, we, uh, we use electricity, uh, et cetera, and, and, and building material, material loss, et cetera. So this needs, uh, is, is uh, something that we have to uh, look at. And as a, a feature, this is on also in a, uh, a lot of green building uh, rating system that as architect, we have to see the, the uh, site planning, how you are uh, efficient. If you're talking about uh, sustainability or, uh, or, or green building, you're talking also about efficiency, uh, use of resources because we have uh, limited resources. And if, Everybody uh, in the world has already talked about um, uh, net zero carbon buildings, meaning that uh, uh, we consume as well as we 
uh, produce uh, energy or other resources or uh, re remediation of the cities. First is uh, from top to bottom is uh, how we use renewable energy and then we uh, how we, we measure. Right? Measurement is also important because then we, we can reduce demand by that. And then uh, embodied carbon is how your the materials are uh, produced uh, for, for your building or interior or uh, your consumables, the daily consumables. And then uh, how, how you lowering emission uh, in, in your house. And then, and then uh, like I mentioned, reducing the demand. Well, architect's role, if you're uh, going to be one is, uh, you have to pay attention to this uh, nine uh, points, uh, very simple that will reflect in uh, my next present, next uh, case study. First is site planning, how you uh, plan your uh, surrounding, uh, even beyond the, the border of your land title. Then uh, second is uh, connectivity linkage. Uh, how you are not alienated, uh, and third is landscaping. Uh, although we have landscape architect in the in the team, uh, but landscaping is uh, important. Where where you put the footpath, where you put the uh, public uh, public furniture, uh, what kind of trees, uh, low maintenance trees, uh, local trees, uh, etc. And then uh, how you uh, we are we are blessed by uh, in, in the tropical country by by a lot of rain uh, in most part of the Indonesia, how you uh, use that, how you not uh, mine, mining your uh, the, the uh, groundwater. And then uh, building envelope because we designed the, the facade of the building. Uh, it's important that we pay more attention to that. Then natural foundation, uh, natural lighting and building material, uh, especially the embodied carbon that that will be uh, used for your building. And uh, most and foremost, you design for people. You're not uh, designing for yourself or not, you're not designing for uh, uh, a work. That's the, only the effect. You're not de designing a sculpture. Uh, we are different from artists. We are, uh, 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 we need to know the culture, uh, which extensively, uh, discussed in the previous presentation. I hope we can have a fruitful Q&A, but uh, you know, uh, it's always people, always uh, people, uh, always diversity uh, from uh, children to uh, people with uh, limited uh, uh, abilities, things like that. And then the, the, the discussion also include the circular economy that uh, in principle that nothing is wasted. Uh, uh, all the excess of our uh, activity will be the, uh, will be the source uh, resource for others. So uh, in uh, hundreds of years, uh, we always look for uh, new resources, uh, mineral, food, uh, water, uh, etc. And now we have to uh, think harder how we uh, we we uh, we share and we limit the resources. Now uh, already the concept is uh, self-sufficient and uh, resilient city. How we not uh, importing uh, goods and uh, products from from outside as as much as possible. Of course we cannot avoid uh, hundred percent. Uh, in some cases the, uh, we can, but. Um, in a city and urban context, the uh, the land is scarce and people are uh, looking for uh, livelihood. Then we need to rethink of uh, uh, the resources, especially the land that is very uh, limited. Um, if you're talking about uh, city, then you talk about neighborhood. How we are interconnected. It's not always uh, high rises, although it's necessary to release some the burden of the land. But uh, how uh, in, in Indonesia, especially, people forget how to walk. Uh, they 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 are uh, always in the car or in the in a on a motorcycle. Uh, we're using urban design guideline as a tool. It's uh, one of the first uh, project cases that I'm going to uh, present. Is uh, uh, how we we design a transit oriented development. 
and how we use the urban design guidelines to measure up uh, the environmental condition, the wind, the, the sun, the, the all, all, all uh, natural features, and how we, we encourage the government uh, to redevelop to uh, uh, yeah to redevelop the city to so so it it will be the uh, it, it it will be a, 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 a more livable cities to 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 to, to the people. Uh, yeah, first uh, project is uh, in Duku Atas in Jakarta. It's a it's a TOD area. There's a several um, uh, transportation. Uh, it's a transportation hub. There's a airport link uh, railway then there's uh, MRT and then there will be to to LRT and several uh, trans Jakarta or, or BRT connections uh, as you can see here that there's a uh, uh, some uh, this uh, uh, that's that's the area and and the surrounding there will be LRT there and there's a uh, uh, sorry, there, there will be a LRT there, and there's a, also a commuter line and uh, airport uh, connection uh, to the to the west. Uh, that need to be combined. And uh, if we we look into the original planning of the area, then there should be land consolidation. At the moment, it's uh, low story uh, development. And this is the current uh, condition. Uh, BNI City uh, Station is actually the uh, uh, airport link, and there was no place for people to walk. Uh, almost not no place, only uh, uh, this part that actually connect from the commuter uh, train station to the uh, railway uh, link, and then to uh, MRT to the to the left of the picture. Uh, this, uh, lack of uh, open spaces is happens uh, all over Jakarta actually. That this is the MRT station at the moment, and this is the the tunnel that uh, uh, just been shown. And uh, everywhere is uh, uh, online uh, transportation. Uh, stopping, waiting, uh, no place for, you know, even they're blocking the, the street shop, things like that. It's not human at all. Then we propose a redevelopment uh, uh, by way of uh, urban design. This is the existing uh, tower, future tower. And this is the, the, the land that uh, we already uh, model, uh, simulate with using the uh, our planning and there's a, a small uh, apa namanya, uh, waduk uh, <coughs> reserv water reservoir uh, to control flood and everything uh, and that, that's a, a one TOD area based on MRT uh, station of Duku Atas. Uh, well, the impact is important. So when we design, we calculate that the, there will be one uh, 0.7 million uh, mixed-use development. Uh, it will create 110,000 jobs in that area, and there will be a lot of pedestrian uh, walk, uh, President Way, 10.6 uh, kilometers, uh, and one of the uh, will be 10 hectares of uh, 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 parks. There will be five transit mode that that can be reached by five minutes walk, and uh, and replanting of trees. So uh, this is what has been done by the the government. They uh, by way the uh, implementation of that planning, uh, a lot of open spaces uh, with uh, a plaza because there will be a lot of movement from from uh, the pedestrian. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, the, the, the main road and uh, Duku Atas station is a little bit below. It's sorry. Uh, and this is the, the, the transit plaza. So you can get a, to a bus from the uh, MRT. At the moment, it's uh, one stop before the end of the line. 
So a lot of people will be getting off here to go directly to 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 the, to work to in the building or do some activities, but also taking uh, other mode of transportation to get where they want. So it's a kind of a hub uh, place. This is the uh, the redevelopment of the uh, the 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 highway, the bridge that will incorporate also uh, people movement to move people from uh, north to south, vice, vice versa, and connect uh, pedestrian in cer certain levels. So you can see that uh, this already implemented, the congested uh, tunnel now become a pedestrian connected connection uh, because, uh, again, because it's a transit-oriented development, so uh, uh, people are encouraged to walk. Uh, the motorized vehicle is uh, is put aside, um, so it become uh, can become a, a very uh, uh, lively space for people to walk and even uh, activities. This is in other stations, but you can see that uh, with with the connectivity with the linkages that create opportunities for uh, commercial and businesses, even. Uh, uh, re, uh, uh, old shopping mall become uh, 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 busy again. This is a block block M Plaza that was dead and old. Uh, it, uh, with this con uh, direct connection to MRT station, it become a, a hub and become a more pop, uh, getting more popular. Uh, before the pandemic, you can see the numbers uh, rising uh, rapidly. And for that, uh, back to the tunnel again, you can see the activity, the people are uh, uh, having street performance. Uh, uh, the government uh, um, implemented, installed the LED light uh, during the evening. Uh, you know, to, so people are feeling safe. Uh, imagine previously that uh, there's a lot of uh, car vehicle that uh, people, uh, and it's dark. And it's now is a uh, 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 passageway as well as uh, where, where people uh, gather, uh, and also outside uh, the uh, connectivity to the MRT station, we can see uh, the the broadening of sidewalks. Uh, how people are uh, is a priority, and then. Um, uh, uh, and and we can see that uh, the 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 vehicle will share the the walkway to the with with the people. Uh, the second project uh, is the Jakarta Industrial Industrial Estate Pulau Gadung. It's a uh, uh, in the east of Jakarta. The government mandated that the industrial uh, activity is moved uh, outside from Jakarta. That's the the red. Uh, block here is uh, 400 hectares of land, and if you can see that um, East Jakarta is actually the slowest growth in Jakarta, uh, uh, the second slowest uh, because uh, Kepulauan Seribu is also part of Jakarta uh, uh, area, uh, and they have a, a lot of uh, problem, but also potential because. Uh, if we see that it's uh, very close to the center of East Jakarta, to the uh, CBD, future CBD of East Jakarta, uh, we are uh, also uh, look into the uh, natural features that it's uh, uh, closely connected to to water body and also the we there has a, a canal. Uh, river, and uh, this is the vision, uh, long-term vision, uh, that the potential GFA building there is 11 million square meter in the 400 uh, hectares of land. And what's important is from uh, 100, almost 100 percent built up area, we can open up uh, 94 hectares of uh, uh, green space uh, with. Uh, 27 hectares, including their uh, 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 water area for uh, flood retention and many other uh, function. Then it will be very close to uh, 
public transport mode. There's a one uh, rail line and future MRT and LRT uh, with 17 stops in this uh, area. Uh, then uh, the, the strategy is uh, densifying to open open up uh, uh, public spaces within the, the site. Uh, as you can see there, there's uh, a new uh, green area contributed to Jakarta uh, and divided the development in seven, uh, seven clusters. Uh, this is the scheme of the public transport. Uh, we propose that the, the LRT uh, be drawn into, the, uh, into this area and this, uh, they can even uh, given a, a depot area and there's a LRT line. It may change because we're still in the discussion with the, with the Jakarta government, with the transportation government, uh, Dinas, Trans Dinas Perhubungan. And this is a existing rail line, uh, commuter line. This is an illustrative master plan. So we densify in uh, already, uh, this is uh, Jalan Raya Bekasi. Uh, uh, we put the higher development uh, very close to the transportation hub. And then there's uh, also part of residential. Uh, and uh, on, on the south part, there will be, there's uh, uh, already two uh, train station. Uh, and uh, then we have a, a, a new industrial city that uh, incorporate uh, not heavy industry, but uh, more to creative industry, to a logistic hub, uh, uh, IoT, and things like that. Uh, next project will be in Lombok. Uh, I'm glad I really enjoyed the presentation, uh, Mariam's presentation about uh, how uh, to, to design a community center, mosque, uh, uh, et cetera, in, in the US. Uh, this is in Lombok in uh, uh, almost remote area in uh, Pesantren. Pesantren uh, uh, that, that's affected by 2017 uh, earthquake. Uh, all the building uh, made by brick and mortar completely collapsed. And uh, the mosque is actually our uh, CSR uh, design, and 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 is built by uh, by the uh, swadaya uh, uh, gotong royong. Uh, the idea is how how we 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 learn we learn from local wisdom that uh, the the first the material that in in a in a earthquake uh, zone. We need to uh, design uh, a building that is uh, can can stand the movement, the heavy movement of the of the earthquake, and and it's proven uh, when we we already built the structure. There's another earthquake that the the the, the structure still stands. So we built uh, uh, the, the the pesantren around is uh, is is. Uh, Built by others, but we are focusing on this uh, and the mosque uh, that uh, is uh, becoming a, a a center of the complex. Uh, they have a a yard in front of it, and the idea is not uh, only using the uh, the building itself as an activity, but uh, the steps can also be extend uh, to the the field uh, outside. Uh, this is the. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, that, that the, the main mosque will be in the second floor, uh, and the first floor can be a, a multifunction room, and also uh, for for if, if it is a, a big prayer, it's a good, uh, separate uh, gender separation uh, on the upper side will be male, and uh, uh, lower side will be female. Um, all is uh, based on uh, traditional. Uh, building uh, shape, uh, we uh, and and uh, this is the the first three uh, D sketches, and inside all using the uh, wooden material, um, and it's even using the waste uh, wood uh, from uh, rubber plantation that's already not productive, and uh, we make it as a structure. 
and it's built built by uh, by the people themselves. So they create uh, collect donation. We do design uh, contribution, uh, uh, but it's uh, something that uh, we're very proud of. Uh, and 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 even before it's completed, uh, uh, of course, with safety measures, uh, because also because of the you know the donation and everything, the the most uh, is uh, ca ca can be uh, gradually used. Uh, it was it, it was uh, two years. This photo was taken two years ago, and now it's already uh, uh, almost one hundred percent completed. Is uh, the praying hall is very open. Uh, the the main feature of the 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 mosque is the uh, 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 structure, the the roof, and the plaza and the, the stair in the plaza. So you can see that uh, how we can uh, uh, design inside and outside uh, space. Uh, then next one is uh, more like a residential development. Um, uh in uh in south of uh, in west of jakarta how how you uh, introduce uh from from traditional uh, <coughs> uh subdivision uh you look into natural features there's a a, a big uh, river uh, uh in front of the development how you create a community that is uh, connected uh always close to public uh, semi public uh, because it's uh, uh, almost get it uh, but also look into the the river as a, a a frontage of the development so we create a river walk this is uh, a lot of uh, development in, in in jakarta or in indonesia are uh, turning uh, back uh, their 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 front to uh, to the river so uh, what we try to introduce here, how, how you look into the river, you uh, utilize the river and, uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's under construction, it's uh, almost completed. And we also create uh, a community space, a clubhouse, which is uh, uh, designed based on uh, openness, uh, even open to, again, to uh, waterfront. We uh, design uh, from 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 the master plan into uh, detail one by one. How how you introduce uh, uh, how how you detail uh, is is uh, quite important to to student to know that from your concept from your beautiful drawing how you detail, uh, design uh, design the the uh, detail. So it. It will uh, uh, stand longer. Uh, it's not uh, leaking. It's not uncomfortable for for the the, the resident. You know? Is this is the the concept? Uh, how you zone the the house itself before you create a massing and going up, and how you bring out uh, the fresh air. Uh, this house can be without air conditioning if if uh, if they 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 want, but if they should need air condition, then they they can put it in a, a specific very uh, small space requirement. So uh, it is uh, designed before the pandemic, and we are already thinking about you know how people can live uh, very healthy. You have to have a, a distance from your back, uh, at least two opening to let the air flow, let the air flush uh, outside. Uh, how you reuse, re reintroduce uh, balcony. Uh, then uh, you can see this is the on the left is rendering, but on the right uh, is uh, is uh, completed this uh, show unit actually. But you can see the space, the living room, how. When when people where people uh, 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 do their uh, most uh, their activities before they go go to bed, and then uh, you can see there's a <clears throat> a courtyard. Uh, this is one of the uh, bigger uh, bigger uh, uh, house 
but you can see that uh, how you utilize a small space uh, as a courtyard. Uh, across, you have uh, a very private, very private, uh, very private uh, bedroom. But uh, you 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 can see that you can you, you can see that uh, uh, that it's uh, opening to the courtyard. I apologize. I'm sharing a room with my uh, daughter <laughs> in school, so it's a oh, it's bit <laughs> interruption. This is uh, uh, the, the 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 show house. Uh, the next project is uh, the stadium that uh, was mentioned before, Jakarta International International Stadium. It's a, a, a stadium for eighty thousand uh, people. I, I Jakarta, as a big city, as a uh, as a metropolitan city, doesn't have a stadium since uh, Lebak Bulus Stadium was uh, was demolished to make way for MRT. Um, yeah, uh, so. The, the concept again, uh, utilize, utilizing the existing uh, rail line that is on the north of the site, but also uh, proposing uh, Transjakarta and LRT and uh, for, for uh, future MRT connection. Uh, uh, the, the land is not uh, big for the stadium uh, of 80,000 people. It's almost as uh, it's as big as almost as big as uh, GBK. GPK itself have uh, uh, more than 400 hectares of land with a, a sport facility of 100 hectares. This is only a third. And how we utilize the, the park around it. Uh, in, in total, it has uh, 70 hectares of land, but for the stadium is just under 20 hectares of land. Uh, this, this project was a result of the design competition. And again, we talk taking uh, Indonesian uh, Jakarta culture, how you build a stadium, but not only the stadium as a white elephant or uh, that that will cost the, the city monies in the long future, but also the how how you can uh, utilize the stadium for twenty four hours to create retails and public space because uh, originally. This was a park, uh, a park that was uh, occupied by uh, illegal housing. So we want to bring the park back. Uh, so the we want to the, the front of the stadium becoming a, a, a green uh, open space, green area. So everything uh, is uh, not in the basement, but under the berm. So we're not creating or digging any basement, but utilizing the shape of the stadium. Uh, we want to have uh, all the facilities underneath the park. That's the, 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 the first concept. Uh, uh, bring back the park with uh, four themes and, and connect it to, uh, to, the, to, to, to the, the lake, to Waduk, uh, Waduk Sunter, that can also become a, a activity for, uh, for uh, the sporting uh, event. Uh, and and the concept is uh, creating from the uh, from the the head of uh, uh, Betawi uh, groom from the you know the the, the clothes of uh, the Betawi people. And then this one of uh, the stadium that has a, a, a roof, a retractable roof. Uh, and for the facade, we have uh, perforated uh, metal and. Uh, you can see this uh, in, the, in, the, in this uh, diagram. This is the, uh, the site plan that it will connect to a park, uh, the public plaza, the concourse uh, surrounding the stadium for easy access and two, two main access uh, for public uh, create, uh, connected to future public transport. And there's two uh, uh, training or, or uh, warm warm up pitches that that's there that will be used daily, and all other uh, park uh, facilities uh, surrounding. And this is the initial uh, design, the first design. Now it uh, 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 transforming into this. Uh, although it looks like it's covered, uh, but it's actually uh, uh, perforated and. The facade itself uh, uh, will bring the uh, air movement inside. Uh, 
you can see from this uh, diagram that uh, how we will uh, bring uh, the air, the light uh, to the, the stadium <laughs> and the concept of the facade itself, how you, you know, the, the perforation will match the Machan Kemayoran uh, concept. It's like the, the, the tiger as one of the, our uh, symbol for the football, Jakarta Football Club. And it's a three-tier seats, uh, Tribune Stadium. Uh, this is uh, rendering from the inside, and it, when when it is empty, uh, so 100% seats uh, are uh, can can uh, has no obstruction. This is a uh, foot. Uh, the the stadium is only for football, so you you don't have the athletic track around it. Um, well, this is uh, the, the height of the building is about 70 meters. So you can see that uh, underneath the tribune, even un underneath the, the football field, uh, we put uh, parking. So we don't put parking outside uh, and we don't have uh, a lot of parking because we will have a lot, uh, a lot of connection with public transport. This is the main concourse. The main concourse is designated only for uh, people who has ticket during the match or event, but everybody outside can uh, uh, can also participate outside the the stadium because there's a lot of uh, uh, park uh, space. Uh, so this is a section, diagrammatic section through the the building, uh, and it's already uh, have a design recognition for green ship platinum. Uh, with this uh, perforated facade. Uh, and this is the feature uh, for the building material, uh, sustainable building material. The uh, corporate lobby, we have a, a corporate box surrounding the stadium is uh, also matching the stadium, uh, international stadium uh, in uh, around the world. So a new standard of stadium. We even have a public uh, track uh, on the roof for people to, you know, uh, yeah, they can exercise on the roof. They can uh, just see the city. It's across uh, uh, the, the view from the top can can reach to the north shore of Jakarta to Ancol. And this is the construction uh, uh, progress when it just started uh, about uh, one and a half years ago. Uh, with the, all the uh, uh, construction activities, they have uh, six main posts, sorry, eight uh, main posts. Uh, and there's a, uh, the, the, the training pitch is uh, completed first. Uh, and then you can see this, uh, they started to have uh, this uh, concourse. Uh, and you can see this in the background, there's a Jakarta and there's a, a few to the north. Uh, imagine that there's, uh, on the roof you have a, a public space. And it's just uh, next to the uh, Jakarta Outer Ring Road, Tall Road. You can see here, this is a rail line from Tanjung Priok. Then, uh, the image, uh, this is the, la, la, the photo that taken last week, uh, how it incorporate again, uh, and the surrounding people still uh, planting some, uh, you know, uh, garden and parks and things like that. And this is the, you know, the, the facade, the perforated facade uh, is coming up. And this is uh, seen from the lake and from the uh, uh, training pitch. And this all the people that involve, uh, architect is one of them, but uh, there's a builders, there's interior designer, uh, uh, engineers, etc. even green building expert. A uh, few slides, just a couple of slides of the commercial that we built is even uh, maybe it's 10 years ago, or uh, uh, eight or 10 years ago in Cirebon. You already use 
at at the moment <coughs> uh, the trend is actually you having a commercial um, open uh, it's not like a big box small uh, we we propose it uh, a long time before that it's uh, a mall that is open uh, you can see that using the tensile structure uh, very open uh, uh, very minimum air conditioning even uh, a lot of uh, open space uh, so how how then we can easily adapt through this uh, pandemic at the time uh, so using sustainability uh, concept uh, as in your practice doesn't does pay pay, pay it off so uh, now people are seeking for uh, gathering places that safe uh, outside open uh, with uh, natural flow of of air <clears throat> natural air flow even it's a uh, uh, could be accessed by anybody you know people is not intimate intimidated by the luxury of uh, uh, conventional indonesian shopping mall but they can have a you know a mall and a park at the same time is uh, built even before the, the the central park in in jakarta uh, but it's in a smaller city in cirebon uh, the next project is uh, pacific center place this a high rise 40 stories uh, what we want to uh, highlight is how the uh, this commercial project uh, <clears throat> on the ground floor it, it it blend with the the public space surrounding uh, how the uh, we we treat the facade so the uh, we we reduce the demand for the uh, building cooling. And you can see that this drop off. We, we try to blend it in, uh, blend in the public space inside to the lobby, and even the, some of the the area is it's not uh, physically uh, fence with high fence, but with landscape. With uh, that's the importance of landscape with uh, uh, a, a bush. Uh, trees uh, and even people can uh, go in and out uh, and there's uh, also having a uh, health uh, facilities uh, on the top uh, on, a, on the top of the podium and how we create infrastructures such as roads uh, to be uh, greener uh, using the you know the it's, it's not a innovation doesn't always involve uh, high tech but uh, this is available uh, materials that uh, the, the grass still can grow, the, but the car still can pass, uh, even for a walkway. Uh, then the next project, uh, uh, Grand Rubina, is a 20 stories uh, office building. Uh, again, <clears throat> the, the concept is uh, uh, sustainability, how you uh, sustainability is always in the concept how you draw people in how you create connection how you're not uh, distancing or, or alienating people from from your project how you use uh, private space uh, we, we have uh, social sustainability in this concept so we emphasizing on uh, social issues as well as other issues but you know uh, uh, more uh, spaces that can uh, blend in into the uh, public space because it's a uh, it's a connection from from the the main road to uh, residential uh, towers behind is in Taman Rasuna. So if you walk uh, from the main street of uh, Rasuna Said in in Jakarta to the the east, there's a, a fourteen uh, residential apartment towers the house thousand of people so uh, we kind of uh, open up the ground floor and 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 and, and the contour so we, we we need to look into the you know the also the natural features of the the surrounding the, the, there's a difference uh, about one and a half meters to two meters from uh, west to east that we are using that for drop off or you know we, we kind of uh, hide 
the all the uh, motorized vehicle inside uh, underneath the the building underneath the you know the lobby and etc so you can see that uh, on top of the parking garage we uh, put public space and there's a hidden uh, uh, parking space this is the lobby that again uh, blend in blend out uh, to the uh, public space outside the drop off is not in the uh, main road but in the uh, tuck, tuck away behind this uh, building to to give uh, space for more for people uh, this is the this design we are using small pieces small cuts of uh, marble stone uh, uh, their uh, reason one of the important reason is that a uh, bigger slab or of course uh, uh, will have a lot of waste so we it's uh, with a smaller uh, cut uh, we can create something is uh, as interesting it's not flat it's three dimensional uh, it's easy also to build it's uh, also created a, a effect so you can see that this building uh, one of the main feature also the facade that we uh, the building is uh, most are oriented north to south but on the west, it's uh, west and east. It's more uh, um, uh, solid. Uh, you can see that the building will be very dynamic if you walk or you drive. Uh, the open uh, the, the 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 fin will will create a, a dynamic movement. If we see this is because this this photo is taken a little bit from the the <clears throat> the south that. Uh, it's actually open to the south, and you can see this is uh, close. Uh, the facade is uh, look close from to the west and east. Uh, this is a uh, uh, from the pedestrian access uh, across the street. You can see the this is the photo of the interior with the uh, small cut marble, and you see that there there are almost no fence. But there's a dedicated uh, walkway. People just cannot just run run over. They they will stumble into the the, the landscaping. So what I call um, horizontal fence in this in this case. Uh, you can see that uh, behind these uh, stones is a parking grass. Uh, above is open space for uh, for grass, and there's a, a commercial uh, uh, FNB. Uh, uh, in front of it, so people can still uh, interact visually without have to, you know, uh, without a def, uh, without a wall in between. So if you can see there that uh, the land is actually uh, uh, belong to the developers, but uh, the developers contribute to uh, this. Uh, this is the road, and this is the pedestrian way, and uh, this is actually parking in uh, uh, in other buildings. You can see that uh, people will utilize this as a drop off or parking space in front of the building, but uh, the developers agree with us to put uh, trees to shade the pedestrian and also uh, 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 greeneries. Uh, so uh, there's still visual interaction and, and of course it's commercially good. So sustainability uh, with uh, environmental aspect, also with the commercial aspect uh, has to go, uh, uh, if you do it quite, uh, if you do it right, has goes uh, along quite well because then uh, you open up more, the business does, the, uh, will do fair, uh, better. Uh, you can see the access. Uh, sometimes there's security guard, but there's no fence uh, whatsoever. So people feel secure, people still feel safe without physical fence. Uh, and this is actually uh, photos taken recently. This is already a uh, uh, fast food uh, uh, shop here. Uh, people just can uh, walk outside, sit outside, uh, then again, uh, the, the building is already completed in 2016. So before the pandemic, even before the pandemic, uh, that uh, the spaces has been created. Uh, we won award for, for this. Uh, 
EI awards and also international awards for for this project. Uh, the next project is uh, how you treat heritage. Uh, first slide, the the, the title slide I, I show uh, Villa Isola because when I studied there, I'm always amazed with that uh, building. It was built as a villa, but then uh, reused as a, a public building as a university at the moment. Uh, and it stands through through time. This is Pasar Johari in Semarang, uh, Central Java. Uh, if you see that the existing condition uh, at the moment, uh, this is the the map of Old Semarang. Uh, there is a Pasar Johar, the <clears throat> the original Pasar Johar, and there's a Pasar Johar South. South is actually a replication uh, built later. And actually, this uh, tree market was uh, built after, and this is a uh, uh, originally uh, alun alun, uh, uh, and this is masjid uh, masjid agung, and it used to be very important place. Now it's uh, uh, it was run down because of uh, because of uh, the the market growing bigger and bigger and. Uh, not not having the uh, control development, the correct uh, development control. Uh, you can see through times from uh, 17th century, uh, and then uh, the, the the mosque comes first. The then they have alun alun in the mosque. Uh, sort of uh, uh, you can say that uh, it's a uh, during uh, colonial uh, time the alun alun. The civic center is uh, the cathedral because of Dutch uh, Dutch government, and then and, uh, and the, the market goes side to side uh, around the alun alun, including the the, the religious building, the uh, the court, etc. But uh, as uh, they built Pasar Johar and quite successfully uh, by by Thomas Karsten. Uh, then uh, the other market occupying the alun alun, so they have uh, no open space uh, left. And in 2015, there's a big fire uh, destroying the heritage building. You can see uh, this is uh, after the, the fire. Uh, this is the mosque. This is the alun alun that already uh, occupied by. Uh, the market uh, development and the, the original 1938 Pasar Johar uh, when it was like almost completely burned is a national treasure. There's some uh, scheme, uh, also design competition uh, for this. Uh, then Pemerintah uh, Semarang uh, asked us to, to revitalize this. Uh, I I think we, I have to go more quickly because the time is almost up. But the idea is to bring back the alun alun. Uh, we put a, a parking area underneath, uh, even small kiosk. Uh, this is the photo of the previous uh, old pasar. Uh, so you can see we revitalized those three buildings and created a new building uh, <clears throat> to accommodate the, you know the. To, to release the some of the area and then put put people in inside this building, uh, and created a network of uh, open space pedestrian. So uh, if you're talking about architecture, it's not only one uh, uh, building, but also including all the uh, surrounding. Uh, at least the concept uh, in here, we are uh, assigned to do more uh, buildings. This is a. Uh, um, uh, how how you do uh, the roof uh, uh, the modern interpretation of Pasar Johar actually so this is the new building is under construction at the moment and uh, the restoration of Pasar Johar already completed and then you can see how you open the the space to public uh, to alun alun uh, this is the the features that we are proposing and are be, being built uh, reminiscence of uh, the old heritage column and uh, uh, we rebuilt we strengthened the uh, we inject the column with the new with the new concrete and uh, this <coughs> uh, network is actually uh, installation of the cabling uh, around that that was not there but it's necessary to avoid uh, further uh, uh, fire happening. 
uh, this is the process. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't opened uh, uh, the the local government. So how how we release this uh, land becoming a new alun alun space with activities also underneath. Uh, so it's kind of a, a new uh, 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 not not new but uh, re uh, bring back the alun alun. Uh, it has opened at one stage, but now it's uh, closed again. Last time I was there in Semarang, and it has uh, uh, awarded with SIP award, uh, Singapore Institute of Planning award, merit award. So it all in uh, Beyond Building book. I will send one to Bututin for uh, for the library in UPI. I hope it will be uh, very useful for uh, for reference. Uh, not only pretty pictures that I just uh, show you, not only the rendering and things like that, but also uh, write-ups of what we do, our concept, how we arrive to the uh, to to a design. Uh, with that, I will end the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll give back to Pa Yudis to the moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Pa Tio. Is such a mind opening lecture um we've learned that sustainability is not about uh only maintaining environments but uh also economics uh, and social so we have to keep those things uh you know stable and those projects are you know very detailed and inspiring oh okay we have limited time so let's jump to our q a session uh we have uh, a question for Mariam, so please, Mariam. <laughs> Thank you for uh, staying with us. This is from Prof. Barliana. I will read it quickly. Um, question for Mariam: In the last few decades, with the rapid development of Muslim population in the U.S. and Europe, is it true that many churches are being sold and turned into mosques? then how does architects or architectural design play a role in that change, both in terms of refunctionalization, space reorganization, form transformation, aesthetics, elements, etc. Please, um, Mariam. Uh, that, um, <laughs> Jesus, that's all I can say. That's a, <laughs> that's a lot of a question. Uh, whoever asked that question should just come and take one of my classes. Um, but to sum it up, uh, yes and no. There are there there. It's not that it's been a lot of uh, churches being converted into mosques. There's been some, um, and when I say some, it's probably less than like you know a handful. Um, and most of them have to do with the fact that the church um, couldn't, the community couldn't maintain the church anymore. And so they put the church up for sale. And if it didn't go up for sale, then if, if either it was supposed to be demolished, so it would no longer be a house of worship, um, or a developer would buy it and then uh, demolish it for other uses. So some of these, um, you know, uh, churches that are being developed are turning into mosques. The Muslim community is actually, um, if they bought it, they've become historical buildings. So, and I use this as a case example, you guys um, can look them in, um, you know, ArchNet from the Aga Khan program at MIT, there are pictures of them, of mosques, of churches being turned into mosques, but most of them are um, churches that are on the National Historic Building Registration. So they're actually historic buildings that Muslims are renovating and restoring and allowing for people to come into public. As far as spaces go, um, the spaces are restored. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing to think that from the 17th or 18th or even the 19th century, the spaces are very similar to um, a prayer space of a Muslim a mosque. Mm, so not much 
really has to be for a church, the pews just have to be removed and then they become, you know, an open space where we can all pray. Um, Okay, thank you, uh, Mariam. Uh, I hope it is uh, answering your question, Prof. Berli. So, um, Mariam has uh, another thing to prepare. So, she has to um, log off. Yes, right now. Um, um, thank you all so much for the um, invitation, Tutin. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it was a pleasure to um, share some of our work with all of you. I do apologize. It's 10 o'clock here and I have to get up super early in the morning to go to a site. Um, so, and Tiok, it was really lovely to see your work. Um, you guys are doing incredible. Um, and Likewise. I look forward to the students. Um, you know, please engage with us. Um, we'll always be happy to answer any questions um, that you might have. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all in the future. Good night to all of you, or good morning to you guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mariam. Thank you, Maria, Thank you so much, Mariam. Let's sharing give, your experience. Uh, her a round of virtual uh, applause to Mariam. Thank you, Mariam. Thank Maria. you all. Good night. Good night. Good night, Mariam. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. All right. Um, Okay, we have a question from uh, Butu Tim to Patio. Uh, thank you so much for such an inspiring lecture. Could you please share your design method, particularly how you understand the local culture when your project is a way such as one in Lombok? Please, Patio. Uh, thank you, Butu Tim. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, of course, we have uh, the, the design is before pandemi. So of course, uh, ini kita masih bahasa Inggris atau karena udah nggak ada maaf. Boleh pak, silakan pak. <laughs> ya, karena kan memang proyeknya jauh dan setelah bencana gitu ya kita awalnya sebenarnya ada ada uh, di, di kantor ada orang yang aktif di yayasan uh, <coughs> yayasan itu yayasan uh, Mukni gitu ya. Uh, kemudian kita ini apa namanya uh, kita donate uh, desain lah gitu ya dan dan uh, menariknya salah satu dari <coughs> uh, orang yang uh, terlibat itu dia sedang mempelajari bahan uh, kayu bekas yang diolah kayu karet yang udah mati yang bisa jadi bahan bangunan uh, sayangnya uh, kayu karet itu bukan uh, kayu lokal di sana gitu ya jadi uh, kalau ditanya desain method Uh, kalau waktu itu masih bisa ke Lombok, jadi kita uh, survei site-nya, terus uh, menentukan di mana tempat yang paling ideal untuk uh, masjidnya di antara pesantren itu, karena itu pesantren uh, pesantren juga pesantren campur ya, laki perempuan gitu ya. Uh, <tuh> jadi di mana kita uh, taruh bangunan masjidnya, kemudian uh, mulai melihat uh, yang Waktu itu sempat juga banyak di apa namanya eh, banyak eh, dipublikasikan bahwa eh, masjid yang udah ratusan tahun malah nggak runtuh sama sekali waktu gempa gitu ya. Terus kita pelajarin eh, bagaimana sebenarnya eh, sistem konstruksi yang eh, tahan gempa, terus juga banyak menggunakan material eh, lokal gitu ya. Jadi <tuh> ya kita kita uh, apa namanya uh, uh, akhirnya kita lihat uh, dengan dengan owner juga tentunya bagaimana uh, masjidnya dibikin dua lantai dan uh, satu hal yang memang tadi uh, Mariam sebutkan <tuh> uh, masjid tuh nggak harus selalu dom sama ini malah justru bangunan-bangunan lain yang sifatnya entertainment malah Uh, ngelihat uh, Middle Eastern uh, culture pakai dom dan lain-lain kita justru ngambil dari uh, kearifan lokal gitu terus apakah uh, perlu ada dinding tampak gitu ya nggak ternyata juga nggak perlu nah. dan uh, dan bangunannya juga dibangun uh, swadaya gitu ya mereka masyarakat sendiri bangun uh, ada material-material <tuh> yang harus uh, 
standar gitu ya semen dan lain-lain tapi uh, kayu treatmentnya atapnya gitu ya kita sama-sama cari gitu yang yang sebisa mungkin yang dari lokal mudah-mudahan menjawab bututin oke okay, ada komentar bu bututin sudah terima kasih uh, saya hanya teringat saja ini ya karena tadi melihat lombok itu Um, apa namanya uh, kebetulan ketua MDMC Muhammadiyah Disaster Management Center itu waktu itu kan melakukan perjalanan ke sana uh, membantu ini ya masyarakat pasca uh, gempa gitu ya terus masjid itu punya makna yang sedemikian hmm. sedemikian kuatnya untuk masyarakat itu jadi mereka belum mereka masih di pengungsian masih hmm. menggunakan, menggunakan tenda tapi mereka ingin yang pertama yang mereka ingin um, melihat itu adalah masjid gitu ya tapi masjid di sini dalam tanda kutip gitu jadi masjidnya masih uh, pakai tenda juga kemudian hanya ada uh, apa namanya bambu uh, ini ya hanya semacam menunjukkan bahwa itu tuh masjid gitu ya dan itu mereka luar biasa ketika itu sudah di sudah dibangun gitu ya dibuat gitu ya tenda itu uh, banyak masyarakat setempat yang menangis gitu ya melihat hmm. betapa masjid itu jadi seperti mengembalikan apa ruh mereka yang sempat hilang uh, ketika gempa itu terjadi gitu ya. gitu ya tadi teringat itu melihat uh, ini ya apa namanya uh, masjidnya uh, elaboratif lombok sekali gitu terima kasih ya, Pak Tio untuk terima ya. kasih, terima kasih. saya juga jadi teringat uh, pernah ke sana pasca uh, tragedi gempa itu jadi Kami dan tim dari ITB juga membangun masjid di sana, Pak. Dari bambu materialnya. Kami di bawah ya. Pak Andi. Itu sangat oh. uh, momen yang sangat apa, luar biasa bagi kami, gitu. mahasiswa saat itu. Alright, maybe this is one last question for Pak Tio. This is um, you know, kind of my question too. Uh, from Pak Gara, how to convince clients or developers to build sustainable design? Since sustainable design tends to cost more and clients will try to build as cheap as possible. Ya. Yeah. Uh, yang gimana, Pak? Ya. Yeah. Uh, uh, itu sebenarnya uh, ada salah bukan salah persepsi ya, tapi uh, bahwa <coughs> kalau kita bikin green building lah ya yang dibilang lebih mahal tuh green building. Sebenarnya ada pernah kita bikin green building 15% lebih mahal dan kliennya tetap mau buat karena uh, mereka operate sendiri. Jadi 15% uh, tambahan construction cost itu bisa kembali dalam waktu 7 tahun, sedangkan 7-8 tahun. Sedangkan bangunan mereka bisa bertahan sampai dengan uh, puluhan, puluhan tahun gitu ya. Minimal 20 tahun, 25 tahun, bahkan bisa lebih gitu. Jadi mereka ngelihat saving jangka panjangnya. Kemudian pemeliharaannya juga lebih mudah gitu ya. <tuh> Kemudian yang nggak uh, bisa di ini adalah lebih nggak bisa dibayar juga adalah lebih sehat gitu. Jadi uh, hal-hal seperti itu sebenarnya bisa untuk meyakinkan. Uh, di sisi lain sebenarnya ada beberapa hal yang membuat uh, pembangunan tersebut nggak nggak uh, mahal yang nggak costly dengan uh, satu memilih uh, material tadi salah mungkin saya juga nggak singgung tapi ada. Uh, Case study yang udah dipelajarin bahkan dengan 0%, persen uh, mereka bisa ada berapa hotel gitu ya pakai uh, uh, waktu itu AFC yang bikin studinya bahkan tanpa tambahan biaya mereka bisa pu- punya uh, apa namanya hot- hotel yang uh, performancenya uh, bisa bagus gitu ya. Nah yang yang proyek Grand Rubina tadi uh, walaupun karena itu bangunan komersial itu juga kita sangat hati-hati tentang biayanya dia satu dia kita juga harus meyakinkan bahwa bisa laku sebenarnya kalau kita bikin komersial building laku tuh artinya ada tenennya atau ada yang beli gitu perumahan juga gitu apa fitur-fitur greennya pernah saya nggak nggak tampilkan di sini tapi kita pernah bikin desain yang Uh, uh, saya ditantang sama orang ininya uh, apa namanya direktur marketingnya apa yang bikin sebelum dapat kerjaannya apa yang bikin uh, istimewa uh, desain kamu ini perumahan nih saya bilang uh, sambil mikir cepet saya bilang di tiap depan rumah ada taman dan kami desain benar ada taman panjangnya panjang terus sepanjang uh, itu terus uh, lebar tamannya 8 meter. Jadi hampir semua hampir semua lah enggak 100% karena ada rumah-rumah tipe kecil gitu ya, ada 80% mungkin yang uh, 
uh, langsung depannya ke taman gitu. Jadi uh, macam-macam sih cara meyakinkannya. Kalau dari kos, kos sendiri bisa dikurangin. Uh, misalnya kita nggak perlu kalau kita desain rumah tinggal kita nggak perlu atau atau bangunan kantor uh, ma- marmer misalnya atau granit kita bisa pilih bahan lain yang lokal yang harganya bisa seperempatnya. Uh, tapi performanya sama dari saving itu kita buat untuk beli kaca yang uh, lebih hemat energi gitu ya. Jadi uh, memang diawali dari desain sih desain intent dan lain-lain pakai barang bekas apa uh, teman saya di Bandung bikin kantor uh, hampir 100% pakai barang, barang bekas ya kantor kantor uh, dua lantai tiga lantai sih uh, untuk kantor studinya dia sendiri gitu ya tapi uh, hampir semuanya dari bahan-bahan bekas dan didesain sendiri gitu ya mungkin mahal di desainnya bah justru bukan mahal di uh, material costnya oke okay, that's a really nice point of uh, your answer so uh, it's a long term Payback, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can only see the initial cost, but also uh, we have to see what is uh, what it gives uh, to us uh, in the next time. Okay, uh, I think uh, it's the end of uh, our discussion. Uh, I know uh, you still have a lot to discuss, but I regret wrapping up this lecture due to time limitations. And before it ends, let's have some conclusions from today's lecture. Uh, we've talked about different aspects of sustainable architecture. So um, sustainable architecture is not just about building the built environment. More than that, our buildings must improve the quality of uh, the surrounding environments. It has to reach and engage the most important aspect of our design, the user uh, or the community. Ensuring they can live healthy, safely, comfortably, and equally until the future. And of course, we need technology to accelerate the improvement of the quality of our building, to keep up with the line, with the times, to build our mindset about how life's going. Um, and with that, we can build what give back to Earth and go beyond building. Okay, thank you, um, Patio. Thank you, Mariam, uh, for joining with us. Uh, thank you very much for all the attendees. Um, please don't go anywhere. We will have a little photo session uh, in seconds. Please be ready. Uh, open your video. Um, thank you. Back to Pagara. Okay, thank you, Payudis, for leading the great discussion. It was so it's so very inspiring. Also. Thank you to Patio for answering my question. Uh, just like as Payudi said, we will have a, we will have a photo session. So I would uh, I would like to ask all the participants to turn on their camera. I would also like to ask the committee, uh, maybe Paldis, to lead us for the photo session. Okay, one, two, three, four, page one. Next for page two. One, two, three. It would be a great idea for your to give your best smile to the camera and stay still for maybe a minute or so. <laughs> Because we have no clear idea on which slides you are. Okay, it's done, Pagara. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you for all this. So, yeah. as, the, as the photo session is finished, we also arrive at the end of this event. Therefore, the eighth and also this course last architecture lecture series titled Sustainable Design in Practice has concluded. May what we had conducted will be useful for us. And to all participants, thank you for attending this webinar. We hope to see you in another opportunities. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Terima kasih Pak Yudis, Pak Yudis, Bu Tutin, Bu Ilham, semuanya Prof Bali. Terima kasih kembali. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Pak Tio. Terima kasih Bu Bu Lilis. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Terima kasih Bu Tutin, Bu Pak Yudis. Terima kasih Pak Tio. Terima kasih Pak Tio. Terima kasih Pak Tio. Terima kasih bukunya. Maaf. Oh ya ya belum nanti saya kirim. Iya <laughs> terima kasih banyak. Terima kasih banyak sudah bagi-bagi ilmu untuk anak-anak.
minum semua. Sampai ketemu lagi di rapat selanjutnya. Ya, selesai. Yudi mau celebrate? Uh, ngapain ya, Bu? Enak. <laughs> Bikin SPJ. <laughs> Nah, siang ini ada rapat PKTM ya Bu ya, uh, tapi nanti nyambung, nyambung ya at, uh, timnya, maksudnya tim kita jam, jam 4, uh, rapat lagi. Universitas Pembangunan. Oh, Ibu ibu mau mengundang para dosen muda untuk rapat Ibu? Kalau misalnya Ibu mau mengundang jam kan saya rapat PK, PPKM jam 1 sama jam 2. Terus nanti mau rapat lagi jam setengah empat. Enggak ibu mau undangan ibu siapa aja ibu? Yang ini aja oh, yang ben. para instruktur SKA yang di grup itu Bu Ilham. Pak Aldi. Nanti jam empat. Pak Aldi, Pak Agara. Semua yang dosen muda dengan Pak Pauji itu nanti. Karena ini besok harus daftar nama pemateri. Di antara ini itu sudah harus masuk ke PUPR. Di SKK-nya oleh PUPR.